Welcome to this morning's session of the Infrastructure Committee. Uh, we do have a quorum, although we have a couple of members who are running a little bit late and will be joining us both in the chamber and by a starleaf. Um, just for those who are here, we'll just remember to maintain our social distancing throughout the meeting. The committee this morning will cover subordinate legislation. We will receive a departmental briefing on the progress on options for um, driver and vehicle agency issues that will obviously include um, MOTs and driver testing. Um, and we're also then receiving a briefing and this will be a joint briefing with the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium Logistics UK and Road Haulage Association in relation to issues which are currently facing freight. Um, in and around coming into Northern Ireland. Um, at this stage, the only apology that we've received is from um, Mrs Kelly. Others, as I've said, are running late. Um, moving then to item two, which is chairman's business. Um, the chair's liaison group um, were to meet yesterday. And in fact, um, we, we, were, we did meet, but it was unfortunately then in an informal capacity as um, very few other members then um, attended. Um, so we had an informal discussion just in relation to um, the updated health protection regulations and how these will impact on committee meetings. Um, there will be um, a sort of a summary um, circulated um, to committees um, over the coming days as to um, the options available to us. Um, and. Um, what we plan to do. Obviously, there are pressures with regards to numbers of folk who are in the building and also how um, that's also managed via um, the, um, those who, who work our, our technical side to, so that there are difficulties for them. So it's really about how we, we look at our meetings in the future, the length of our meetings um, and the type of business that we also um, consider in, in the coming weeks. So that will be circulated, I'm, I'm guessing, to members in advance of next week's meeting, so we may then have a better chance then of having a, a fuller discussion as to what we want to do then moving forward. So members are, are, are content with that. Moving then to um, draft minutes, you'll find those at page six of your briefing packs. That's for the meeting of the 13th of January. Are members content to agree? No dissension? Okay, thank you. Moving then to matters arising, that's item four at page 15, and again, that's for the meeting of the 13th of January. Do members have any issues which they wish to raise arising um, from the meeting? At page 20, we have um, outstanding committee requests for information, um, and some of that is, is well overdue. Um, so um, I'm guessing reminders will be sent to those who still um, need to send us through some information. Are members content with that? Yeah. Moving then through to item five, a um, number of pieces of, uh, of correspondence. At, at page 30, we have the, the memo. Just draw your attention to the item at page 32, which is correspondence from the Transport Hub alternatives group and they're requesting a, an opportunity to meet with the committee just with regard to concerns that they have around the develop plan, development plans for the Belfast Transport Hub. Also just draw your attention to the fact that um, this correspondence seemingly had been sent last March and they were obviously concerned that they hadn't received any correspondence. I understand speaking to staff that they have checked all the systems and that hadn't been received so in case that's of concern two members. Um, do any, does anyone have any thoughts as to how this should be dealt with? Obviously, this is very much a specific issue around um, the transport hub um, development. Nobody's any consideration around that. Um, obviously, they would like to, to meet with some of us to discuss that. Um, what we could do is actually ask them maybe if they want to detail some of their concerns mm -hmm. um, and we can maybe table that at a future meeting and, and certainly share that with the department. Okay. okay. 
Page 38, we've correspondence from Belmont Strategy, just requesting to, to meet with myself just with regard to battery energy storage schemes. Um, they, they have, they've also they've detailed some of the concerns that they have, and if members are concerned, if members are um, content that we share that with the department and highlight um, the issues that they have raised, um, I'm content to, to meet with them if the committee, is con if the, the, the committee is content. Okay, thank you. And I see Mrs. Yeah. Mrs. Kelly is no longer apologising. She's actually here. Okay. Um, tabled at page four, we have the interim report from the examiner statutory rules, um, Angela Kelly, and she's highlighted three SRs, um, 202292, which is the Planning General Permitted Development Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, SR 202299, the Motor Vehicles Driving Licenses Amendment Number 2, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and also SR 202300, the Planning Environmental Assessments and Technical Miscellaneous Amendments, EU Exit Regulations 2020. Um, we agreed those statutory rules, subject obviously to the report from the examiner. Um, she has now advised that she'll not um, draw special uh, attention um, of the Assembly to SR 202292 or 202300. She will, however, draw special attention to um, the Assembly to SR 202299, and that's the Motor Vehicles Driving Licenses Amendment Number 2. Um, order. Um, the regulations were made on the 2nd of December, laid on the 3rd of December and came into force on the 7th of December. Um, the department has acknowledged in correspondence that the regulations were led in breach of the 21-day rule, explaining the reason for the breach. Um, there is a general contentment, isn't there, that um, they had provided a, a, a satisfactory reason for, for the breach. Um, are members content to note? Okay. Um, obviously, there are actions then for the remainder of the correspondence in the memo. Are members content with that, or have you any other concerns or issues you want to raise? Nothing? Okay. Thank you. Moving then to item six, which is. Um, Subordinate legislation not subject to assembly proceedings at page 64, and it's SL1, the Parking Places Disabled Persons Vehicles Amendment Number 3 Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Um, the proposal for the statutory rule is to authorise parking places with unlimited waiting for disabled persons vehicles in Crossgar, Cross McGlen, Downpatrick, Dundrum, and Londonderry. Um, the proposal is not subject to assembly proceedings. Are members content with the proposals for the SR? Yep. Okay, thank you. Just move you then through to um, agenda item 13, which is in your table papers. Um, it refers to the subordinate legislation, so on its further financial assistance scheme for taxi drivers. Um, it's tabled at page six. We have the proposal for the statutory rule. Uh, the department proposes to make a second set of regulations to provide a further financial assistance scheme for taxi drivers. The statutory rule will be, will be subject to negative resolution procedure. The new scheme is designed to address two issues. Firstly, it will provide financial assistance specifically for those drivers who had partial insurance during the six month period from the 22nd of March to the 30th of September. That's the period which was covered by the first scheme. And secondly, it will provide further assistance to all eligible drivers for the period from the 1st of October 2020 to the 31st of March in recognition, obviously, of um, continued financial pressures associated um, with um, COVID-19. We do, have, we do have officials here if members wish to call on them and ask for any, ask any questions. However, we did receive um, quite um, an extensive update in relation to this last week. Um, so officials are required, or are here if required. Do members have any issues that they would like to raise at this point? Or any questions, Ms. Anderson? Um, 
Chair, I just um, like to make the point I made it last week. I don't know if you want to bring officials in, um, but I would I would certainly like it noted that I think that those drivers who took insurance breaks will still have issues with the pro rata scheme. Um, those who were shielding or who had to stop cover for financial hardship uh, will be penalised uh, for doing so. So I would like the department uh, maybe to tell us, even if we have to do so by writing, because I don't want to stop this SL are going through or SL1 going through. I think no one does because we know we need the taxi drivers to get the further support out the door. That said, I would like to know if there's any intention to do perhaps a supplementary payment to cover those, di those drivers who temporarily suspended their insurance. I think that's going to become an issue as we move this forward. Many of us, if not all of us, have been in touch with drivers who have contacted us. Um, some of them, their testimonies um, are heart-wrenching, as we all know. And I think that the whole committee would support perhaps um, another uh, a supplementary payment, if that's what it takes, rather than stopping this one, so that those that drivers are captured and that they get the full grant. Okay, well, we, ha we have um, Chris Hughes, Director of Safe and Accessible Travel, and Beverly Cowan, Head of Driving Policy, um, on Starleaf, so um, perhaps if they would like to respond to that point which is being made and whether any consideration is being given um, to that specific issue. Yeah, okay. um, at the moment, the, uh, the SL1 is to... Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, the SL1 is currently to enact what was uh, put forward to the executive. So that is the payment which is pro rata at the moment to provide value for money. So at this stage, we're looking at this SL1 and this payment scheme, and um, there isn't consideration at this point in time going on. I think that uh, of an additional payment, this is about getting the last one closed up and this one operational. Okay, Mr. Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I would like to support Martina around this because the impression that has been taken around this new scheme is that it will support people who only had partial or downgraded insurance. And the reality is in this scheme, my understanding around this is that uh, you will get payment when you had the full insurance, but you're not getting any payment for the periods of time where you had that downgraded insurance. Uh, and as a result of that, there's still going to be a significant number of taxi drivers who are not going to get the level of financial support they need. And we need to be able to support them because hopefully this year is the year when we're going to start to move out of the pandemic, but we need to be able to support them to get through it. And uh, I think it needs to be consideration what further support can be given in an additional scheme to, to drivers during the category that's been talked about by Martina and I. And I don't know whether that's something that is a view from the department that this is the second and final scheme or is there consideration for something else? Uh, the, the, the scheme is in response to the evidence of additional requirement for need. So, I mean, that's the one that's in front of us at the moment. So I don't know what the future is going to, to hold. So I wouldn't like to, to say that we will or won't do, you know, or the minister will or won't do anything based on the evidence that's available at, you know, in the future. Um, but what I can say is that, they, as Julie said last week, the main support to taxi drivers is, of course, you know, through the self-employment income, income support scheme. So this specific scheme and the two, the, this first scheme and the second scheme both replace expenditure that was actually incurred so if people didn't incur expenditure then that wasn't a, that wasn't an outlay that needs to be replaced so that was the rationale which provided the value for money underpinning the scheme so if people didn't incur the expenditure then um, they didn't you know the value for money wouldn't mean that then it was replaced so there are other means of support with the you know through, available to taxi drivers this is you know, this is this is to replace expenditure incurred yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for that. I think the issue for me is that if you um, downgraded your insurance because you're, there's no, there's very little trade for taxi drivers at the moment because it's only essential travel that's meant to be undertaken at the moment. So if you downgraded your, your insurance, then that's inhibiting you from able to claim uh, for that period. But the issue is, is that you're still having overheads. You're probably still having lease payments on your car, car and other like. So there's still outgoings in relation to that. It's not just a matter that. If you have your insurance downgraded, you have overheads. You still do have overheads. 
So the um, the overheads that the scheme uh, is designed to replace that people had outgoing were based on the evidence provided to us by the by the sector themselves. The largest by far was the uh, requirement to provide the uh, the insurance, and the other uh, elements of that were taken into account were the needs for expenses incurred by actually um, running your business. For example, the additional costs incurred by um, cleaning your car and providing for PPE, which obviously if you're not working you don't incur. So and the self employment within some income support scheme, then provides the other ongoing business support. So that was the, it was specifically looking at the additional costs incurred by running, by doing your business and the costs incurred with doing that. So based on the evidence provided. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Hildage. Chair, Chair, sorry. sorry, Mr. Hildage. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, just to follow up on the uh, situation facing those who took an insurance break and had the shield, uh, would, it, would it have been possible for, even for if there was a, a letter or anything in relation to shielding had been issued by uh, obviously the health department? Would that have helped those people? And I know you've indicated that it's for PPE and such like, but if somebody took a two month break or three month break, will they still have to get that PPE at some stage, whether you're, whether you're in, the, in the lot that's getting the 3,000 or whether you're lot that's getting the 1,500, it still has to be supplied at some stage? Um, well, that would be a cost that was incurred then whenever the person started to work. So at that stage, if they had taken the full insurance, then they would be eligible to provide for the, then they would cover that. The insurance is the, is the main way of indicating that somebody is actually um, working. So if they're not, if they're shielding, they're not consuming uh, yeah, PPE they still or have cleaning. To, still have to, maybe two months later, get the taxi back on the road and still have the cost of the shields and whatnot that goes in the taxis these days and different equipment has and to be still, still has to be purchased whether you're two months out of the job or not. And at that stage, then once they start incurring those expenses, they're eligible for the for the uh, for the support scheme. Yeah, but not as much as somebody who hadn't been shielding. Yeah, because they hadn't incurred the main expenditure, which is the insurance for the period when they well weren't insured. Yeah, it's just chicken and eggs. So. Great, Miss Anderson, you want to back in? Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, Chair, just had you on mute there. Uh, Chair, look, I think I think terms for the taxi industry and the taxi drivers to file you for money is somewhat insulting, Chris. I know you don't mean to uh, insult them, but I think when they hear uh, terminology like that, because for many of them, um, they not alone were they shielding, like some of them were getting cancer treatment and there was a delay in the time they renewed their insurance or some of this is, you know, exceptional circumstances should have been taken into account in some cases. But I think the point that David has made, or David made is the one um, that needs to be really considered by the department. These overheads were incurred by taxi drivers. They may have been delayed, but they all had to pay for the PPE and the shielding once they started to work again, and they did. They only temporarily suspended their insurance because we told people that the stay at home message was important. So the customer base and the, the self-employed scheme that you talk about hasn't been available to taxi drivers in the sense that they couldn't access it because of the kind of profit that they make is minimal. So I think that in relation to this, I think what the committee is asking is that the department take account because what you don't want taxi drivers being hurt which many of them will be as a consequence of this, that the minister will come under pressure as a consequence of this. We don't want, as a committee, the taxi industry coming back to us because of the fact that, um, that these drivers who, for all legitimate reasons, hadn't the money to pay their insurance at that moment in time and temporarily suspended it, but then they went back renewed their insurance and then they were out the same amount of money and overheads. I don't think I think we should try to avoid any unnecessary mess and whilst this SLR doesn't allow you to do that because it's already been brought forward. But what we are asking I think as a committee is a temporary scheme is put in place to capture those drivers who temporarily suspended so that they are dealt with in the same way as others. And I must say, just like bus operators, taxi operators also need to be dealt with at some stage within the department because they have not been captured in these schemes. Okay. Members, any other questions at this stage? Okay. Let's thank um, Chris and Beverly. Um, okay. So can I 
take it from members that we're content with the proposals for the statutory rule and that we will write to the department if you're content, first of all, with the statutory rule. Okay, thank you. Yes. And then if you're further content, if we write to um, the minister, just with relation to the concerns that we have, um, particularly around those who had to shield for, for no fault of their own, who were caught as a consequence of the pandemic and had um, obviously costs incurred that we write to ask that that be revisited. Um, and absolutely right that the point that Martina made I was going to, to make as well, um, uh, that we do write again urging um, her to revisit her decision with regards to to taxi operators um, in the SL1, the cover note that we've received, we obviously hear about the ongoing restrictions on retail, hospitality, sport, leisure, the impact that has on taxi drivers financially, that equally has the same impact on taxi operators. And perhaps if we could also ask for an update with regards to coach and private bus operators, because now we know that this scheme has been extended, I think we need some clarity as to whether the scheme for the coach and bus operators is also going to be extended. Are members content with that? Okay. Um, Mr. Boylan is now sure, joined us. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mr. Boylan, do you want to raise a point? No, Chair, it's already been raised. Martina's dealt with it because I was contacted in relation to the SL1 as well. So I'm happy enough for that to proceed. Okay. Members content? Mr. Beggs? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Moving then on to um, item number seven, which is the departmental briefing with regards to progress on options <coughs> for driver and vehicle agency issues. Uh, you'll find the briefing paper at page 67 of your pack. Hansard will record the session and we shall welcome uh, Mr. Jeremy Logan, who is the chief executive of DVA, and uh, Pat Delaney, who is uh, Director of Operations at DVA. Good morning. You're both very welcome um, to um, the committee. Um, can I ask um, Jeremy, are you going to make a, an opening statement and then members um, will follow up with some questions? Certainly. Okay. Thank you for the invitation to come to the committee today uh, to provide an update on DVA services. This follows the previous update, which was provided on the 4th of November last year. We have provided a briefing paper to the committee in advance of today's session. I will draw out a few points from the paper about the current position on DVA services, and then I will ask Pat, our Director of Operations, to say a few words about the plans looking ahead. As is the case with many public-facing services, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on DVA services, particular, particularly vehicle and driving test services. We have conducted an extensive review of our risk assessments, and these are regularly reviewed to ensure they take account of the latest public health advice and guidance to ensure the safety of our staff and customers. Inevitably, this has meant that our testing capacity has been reduced as we continue to ensure the necessary and proportionate controls are in place, such as hand sanitisation, social distancing and the wearing of face coverings. We know this has caused disruption for our customers and we are working hard to mitigate against this. In terms of MOT services, vehicle testing is taking place at all 15 test centres and has not been affected by the current lockdown restrictions. From the 20th of July, we resumed testing for priority vehicle groups including those not able to avail of temporary exemption certificates, and we have steadily increased our testing capacity since then by bringing forward additional vehicle categories for test. From this month, we have increased our vehicle testing capacity to ensure we can test those vehicles whose 12-month TECs will start to expire early this year. To achieve this, we have adopted a range of measures, including the recruitment of additional vehicle examiners, the use of overtime to provide cover for leave and sick absence, and the reduction of the vehicle test time. We will continue to issue TECs to all eligible vehicles until normal testing services resume. This will ensure that all vehicles can be kept on the road. However, it is important for owners to understand that it remains their responsibility to make sure their car is maintained in a roadworthy condition to be used on a public road. Turning to driving tests, you will be aware that driving instructors have been included in the executive regulations on businesses that must close until the 5th of February to help stop the spread of COVID. 
driving tests have also been suspended over this period of increased restrictions based on the same public health and scientific advice. Motorcycle lessons and tests are not affected by these new restrictions. Planning for the resumption of driving tests once the current period of lockdown restrictions ends, the Minister announced last night there will be a phased reopening of the booking service to prioritise bookings for customers based on the expiry dates of their theory test pass certificates. Pat will provide more detail on our plans shortly. In terms of the financial position, I am pleased to advise the committee that the financial position is much improved from our last update on the 4th of November. The agency has secured allocations of resource funding totalling $20.9 million to address some of the lost fee income arising from a result of the COVID pandemic. The current estimated remaining shortfall in fee income is £10 million. The committee will be aware from last week's briefing on January monitoring that a bid has been put forward to the Department of Finance for a further £10 million to address this shortfall. Suffice to say, the finance position remains challenging and is being continually monitored. I will now provide a brief overview of our plans for reintroducing driving tests when the current lockdown restrictions end. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, Chair, um, following the decision to suspend driving tests for six weeks from the 26th of December, we took immediate action to contact those affected customers, cancel their tests and refund their fees. We have now written to those customers to advise them how they can reschedule their appointments and they will have the opportunity to rebook their test before the service opens to all other customers. We have also met with the Northern Ireland Approved uh, Instructor Council and wrote to all approved driving instructors to notify them of this position at the earliest opportunity. The booking service remains closed for new customers, however. Once the restrictions are lifted and it is safe to resume driving tests, we plan to open the booking service in three phases. Phases one and two will prioritise groups of customers for a limited period based on the expiry date of their theory test pass certificates before the booking service is opened for all other customers in phase three. We estimate that there are around 21,000 customers currently holding a private car theory test pass certificate and have not yet booked a practical driving test. There are approximately 4,500 customers in phase one and approximately 5,000 customers in phase two whose theory test certificates will expire by the 31st of October 2021 and the 31st of March 2022 respectively. Once the executive confirms the date the current restrictions will be lifted, we will contact phase one customers directly to advise them when they can access the booking system. We will ensure there are sufficient driving test appointment slots available to accommodate those customers, but given our understanding of the historical data, we do not expect everyone in this group to book a test. That said, we will monitor the situation very closely before opening the booking system for phase two customers. We will adopt a similar approach for phase two customers whose theory test pass certificates will expire from the 1st of November 2021 to the end of March 2022. This will require us to make further booking test appointments available to ensure we can manage demand. Finally, for phase three customers, the booking system will be open for the remaining customers whose theory test pass certificate expires from April 2022 onwards, and that will be the last group that we'll open the booking system for. However, the exact timings of these phases will be determined by the outcome of the executive's review of COVID restrictions, and a further update will be provided to customers once the position is confirmed. Once driving test services resume, we will aim to maximise the availability of driving test booking appointment slots. We are recruiting additional examiners. We will continue to offer driving tests on a Saturday. And as we move towards the spring and the summer, we will offer driving tests in the evening. We will also use overtime to rota off-duty dual role vehicle examiners who carry out driving test functions as well to provide additional capacity and to provide cover for scheduled driving tests were due to a variety of unforeseen reasons, such as sick absence or the requirement to self-isolate, driving examiners are unable to attend work. 
I am also pleased to say that once these current restrictions end, we will be offering driving test appointments for all categories of vehicle. And following engagement with key stakeholders, we will offer driving tests for heavy goods vehicles on Sundays in Belfast, Craigavon and new buildings, where it is suitable to do so without compromising the integrity of the driving test. We know that learner drivers are keen to take their driving test at the earliest opportunity, and we acknowledge their frustration has been further compounded by the current suspension of driving tests. We are working hard to maximise the availability of test slots across all our test centres, but the COVID restrictions mean that we have had to adapt our services to ensure that they can be provided safely, and we would ask our customers to remain patient at this difficult time. I'm sure we're ready to take questions. Okay, thank you very much um, from both of you. Um, I suppose I'll just start with the, the financial situation. And Jeremy, obviously you've said that you're in a better place than you were um, by virtue of the fact that you've been able to receive um, a considerable amount of money from um, the COVID pot, as, as it were. Um, the, we heard last week, as you rightly said, about the, um, the £10 million shortfall, which is going through January monitoring, which is to address issues for your reserves. Are you in a position today to give us a sort of a broader picture with regards to the situation around reserves. Um, we'd obviously had a number of conversations in the past about how reserves would normally have been sort of anticipated to have been used, um, and obviously that has changed um, over the last year. Yeah, I mean, the position um, with reserves at the start of April 2020, um, uh, the DBA accounts amounted to £37.8 million. Pounds. Um, which was accumulated for planned capital investment uh, and working capital requirements going forward. Uh, and essentially, this was to build a new test centre in Depot at Hyde Bank, um, the replacement of vehicle testing uh, equipment as part of a refresh programme across all our existing test centres, and the development of a new booking and rostering IT system uh, for vehicle testing and driving tests. Uh, that's what the money was earmarked for. Um, obviously, COVID had impacted that, um, but as I said, um, we have been successful, certainly in bids at this stage, circa of 21 million, and this further bid of 10 million uh, will certainly help address uh, some of the shortfall. Um, so, the cash balance at the start of um, or at the end of December was 18.2 million. Um, with the cash for um, secured for COVID funding of 12.2 million being drawn into um, DVA reserves from the department, which would increase our cash reserves back up to 30, 30 million, circa 30 million. So, if we are successful in our future bid, um, we will be back in that position, really quite close to where we were at this time last year in terms of our reserves, and they will be earmarked for the, the areas that I have already explained in terms of Hyde Bank and the, uh, the development of um, our Brooklyn and Rostron systems and our equipment replacement programme. <coughs> so essentially that is what that money would be used for and has been earmarked for. Okay, so the status of those three programmes, Hyde Bank and the refreshing equipment, which of course we've already refreshed all the lifts um, in the last year, and also the IT system, they will then be on track then to be delivered, um, subject obviously to um, any further changes. Yep, that's the position. Okay, thank you. Um, then sort of moving then to um, the MOT situation. Um, obviously, that has it's obviously the challenges associated with lifts, the lifts, and then um, subsequently, then um, COVID then did present considerable challenges. Um, there is a, a remark, sort of item um, within uh, paragraph eight. You'll say you say that the agency will continue to issue TECs to all eligible vehicles until normal vehicles testing services resume. At this stage, what is what is defined as an eligible vehicle? given the fact that you have started to um, test vehicles which are four years old, those with SORN, and have been, are being sold by dealers. I'm just curious as to what that line means. 
Yeah, it's essentially, um, TECs have been issued to the vehicles that we couldn't test, and as you rightly say, we have identified and we have uh, phased our uh, testing programme really from the 1st of June, actually, when we started doing IVA tests, and then from the 20th of July, we brought through those vehicles that couldn't avail of it, and further vehicle test groups from the 1st of September. So, trying to manage those vehicles we can test and issue TECs to the vehicles that we can't to ensure that they can legally remain on the road has been quite critical for us. So, from January this year, um, following an extensive re review of our risk assessments, we've been able to increase our testing capacity across all of our, our test centres, our 15 test centres. And that is to address um, some of the issues relating to the lift issues where TECs were issued from, I think, the 20th of January, uh, where, where, we, where we couldn't test all vehicles. So the vehicles that we tested last year will be receiving a TEC, and conversely, the vehicles that we didn't test last year, um, we will be bringing forward for test um, over this next three months. So it is the balance between testing the vehicles that we can and issuing TECs to the vehicles that we can't, and that is the current position. Now, in terms of the clarity of those, I mean, that information is, is, is on NI Direct. It's quite clear about the categories of vehicles that we're bringing forward for test, and uh, our customers will receive a reminder notice from us when their vehicle is due for test. Uh, they will have to act on that and get their vehicle tested within within the, the time period that's that's advised. Okay, and, and, and no vehicle. Obviously, you're restricted as the length of time for a TEC, so it's 12 months, and at that stage, then it has to be tested, and that obviously then that the onus then falls on DVA in order to ensure that that happens. Well, certainly at the minute, the extension for TECs is to a maximum of 12 months, and that's what we have been working on. And uh, you know some of those, as I say, will start to expire uh, in January. So we have had to say review and revise um, our testing processes in line with our risk assessments to ensure we continue to test those vehicles that are now coming up on their 12-month anniversary of the TEC. Okay, and just finally on the MOTs, um, you've said that there will be a reduction in the current vehicle test time. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean that there will be a reduction in the standard of the test? Somebody take it. Quite happy for Pat to take that. Uh, no, the uh, reduction in time is the reduction in the time made available for the test to be conducted. Um, so uh, the test itself takes 20 minutes. There is no change to the actual test time. The additional 10 minutes that we allocated when uh, we were putting in our COVID measures was to allow our vehicle examiners to avail of the hand washing, um, changing their gloves, uh, doffing, etc. Um, so those were the COVID measures. Now, over a, over a period of time, we have looked at the, the data. Our, our examiners have become familiar with those procedures. They've been doing them quicker. And we have looked at the test data for how long it, it takes to, for a vehicle test to be conducted. And we're confident, and we have introduced now a 25-minute appointment slot rather than a 30-minute appointment slot. But the, the actual time for a vehicle test to be conducted remains 20 minutes. We neither added nor did we subtract from the time available for the test to ensure the integrity of the test was maintained. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you for that clarity. Um, and then moving to driver testing, um, where obviously those who have been waiting anxiously for a test for a considerable period of time now, um, I suppose it is welcome that a plan then was um, published yesterday. And uh, I'm not sure how, how I suppose really, if when you're 17 and you, you've, you've, you've counted down the time to get to that stage of where you hope to get the keys of mum and dad's car um, and then to be put off and put off and put off it is it's very difficult it's one of those sort of very sort of clear milestones within your life um, being able to learn to drive and become independent um, you have said that you've, you've met with the um, Northern Ireland approved instructors council and I'm assuming that has been sort of regular contact um, during this period of time um, and are they generally content with the plan that has been um, published at this stage? We are we're actually meeting with the uh, council this morning, so that conversation is taking place uh, with them this morning to advise them on what the, those plans are, um, and we wait to see what their views uh, are on that. But ha having said that, my understanding is, is that that is something that has been discussed previously anyway, that we prioritise, and the fairest way to prioritise um, and to ensure that those customers whose your e-test pass certificate is about to expire um, are given the first opportunity to, to do their test. 
Okay, um, we've had a discussion in the past about the number of examiners and obviously um, looking at additional examiners during this period of time, how many additional examiners have been added to the workforce? Yeah, I think previously we had identified that our plans were to bring forward 27 um, new vehicle examiners and that is essentially the, the, the best and the quickest way that we could free up then the dual role examiners that are trained to boot, do both driving tests and vehicle tests um, to, to, to help with some of the pressures and demands in that area. Um, we have so far um, brought in 10 temporary uh, vehicle examiners and they have been uh, recruited on appointment and four permanent um, uh, vehicle examiners as well. So the figure is 14 at the minute and offers have been made to a further 12 permanent examiners um, who will be joining us uh, in the next couple of weeks and will be trained to deliver that. So at the minute the number is 26. Um, we have sort of checked with our recruitment agencies and unfortunately the supply at this stage uh, you know, was limited so we have taken the decision to recruit more permanent examiners to fill, fill the gap that we had identified previously and we are looking to bring in further staff um, to, to meet the demand going forward. Okay, and, and if we were in a, a situation where there were no further re um, rest health restrictions and you have the, the current cohort which required to be tested, how long would it take to get through that? On a if there were no restrictions? Yes, if there are no further restrictions. I'm, just, I'm really just trying to get a sense of the length of time of the backlog that you currently have. Well, the, the backlog that we currently have um, can only be measured by the number of people who can apply for a practical driving test. So the number of people who can apply for a practical driving test is around 21,000 because they're the only ones that currently hold a theory test pass certificate. Uh, and our normal, uh, uh, for category B driving tests, our normal um, uh, number of tests that we conduct in a month is 3,900, so roughly 4,000. And working in that basis, if, if we were conducting uh, on a normal basis pre-COVID, you would be saying five months. However, given that we are increasing the number of staff available to do that, and um, we are also looking, and we also have, in fact, um, identified four staff within DVA as dual, uh, dual role driving examiners, and we're going to increase that by a further six to ten and we're going through the process of permanently appointing uh, 10 new driving examiners. That was already in train before COVID, um, and it had to be uh, halted at that time. So we'd be bringing those 10 full-time driving examiners in and working on the basis that uh, they do seven tests per day. They're currently doing five, but from the beginning of February, if restrictions are lifted, we're moving that to six, uh, which is a 20% increase. And we would, be com we would be confident that we would get through the current backlog within that five months. But that's not to say that theory tests, once theory tests open again, that the theory tests um, will then add to that number. So it, it will be an ongoing thing. But if I could just add, I mean, one of my other roles is the uh, Vice President of the International Commission for Driving Testing. And in speaking to my colleagues across Europe, this is, this is a situation that all of us are facing in terms of the backlog. And I think in DVA, um, our unique service delivery model, where we do have vehicle driving examiners, gives us the flexibility that other organisations don't have. Okay, yeah. and just very finally for me, just with regards to um, those who are potential driving instructors, and we've had this discussion about what the plan will be for them. Um, as it currently stands, what is um, the anticipated um, plan for those who are seeking to become driving instructors? Yeah, as Pat mentioned, you know, the good news is that we are reinstating all our driving test categories, including those for uh, potential driving instructors, and we've had a number of representation from um, elected representatives and instructors themselves about getting their, their tests uh, booked. And we were in a position at the 11th of December to start facilitating those tests, and, and unfortunately the restrictions came in. So yes, we will be able to accommodate the tests for those potential driving instructors, uh, but I understand that some will be worried about their qualification period of two years that uh, may expire uh, shortly, and we're certainly looking to see if there's any legislative provision that we can make to, to accommodate that or potentially to extend that, but that's something that we're, we're working through at the minute and we will certainly advise of our position on that in due course. Okay, so that is something that you're actively looking at because that was a question that I wanted to ask because I have been obviously approached by a, a number of driving instructors and driving schools who have had um, an issue particularly um, with the numbers of driving instructors who have left as a consequence of, of COVID and maybe not wanting to come back and then obviously um, not being able to replenish those. Um, 
Um, um, as I understand, the numbers are, are very small in terms of the potential driving instructors in the system at the minute, but uh, nevertheless, we will do what we can to try and accommodate Okay, so you're actively yes. looking at legislation. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Um, Hildage. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just on the vehicle, the driver testing services that the agency are going to make available for Saturdays and Sundays and that, just what the line in point 13, the vehicles uh, maybe on a Sunday where it is suitable uh, to do so without compromising the integrity of the test, what, what you get not there? What, what's the meaning of that? What's the integrity? I'll maybe start and Pat can and clarify. Um, our supervising examiners, obviously, the test has to be done in a fashion that sort of is a true test of your driving standard. And clearly, on Sundays at certain test centres uh, where tests are delivered, maybe the traffic volumes are such that it right. wouldn't be a representative test. So, our supervising examiners have been looking at this across the network to see uh, what centres it's suitable. I think Pat had already mentioned Belfast, Creagav, and, and uh, the dairy centres uh, where the test could be delivered. And you know, the supervising examiners are satisfied that the standard can be met there for those uh, tests to be delivered. And we have consulted with you know our HGV colleagues uh, and the industry colleagues to um, to advise them that that is our proposal moving forward. If I could just add to that, um, those tests that Jeremy was referring to are for the heavy goods vehicle tests, and we've, we've, we certainly have had a significant representation from industry bodies in relation yeah. to that, and we're happy enough to accommodate it. Um, but the same would apply to the Category B tests. We can only really conduct a Category B test if that test can be conducted in, in such a way that the candidate encounters uh, certain uh, hazards, obstacles, road conditions, um, opportunities where their behaviour can be observed, um, and in certain times of the day, particularly on a Sunday morning, for example, um, where there is very, very little traffic on the road, it's difficult for a driving examiner to make an honest assessment of that person's driving ability without them being tested uh, to the level that they need to be for them to be given a certificate to pass the driving test and drive safely on a company. Okay, thank you. And on the situation of pressures on staff at the minute, uh, I know you've said there you've been in, uh, talking with staff and the, the union side of things as well, but obviously there must be a tremendous pressure on staff on the ground. Uh, how is that working out for you as a minute? Or? Well, I have to say the response from staff and trade union side has been uh, incredible throughout the COVID crisis. Um, they have been wanting to get back to work as soon as they can and test vehicles for our customers and, and, and conduct driving tests. And you know, obviously, the, the current restrictions restrate are frustrating for them in that regard. But I mean, we've worked very collaboratively um, with our unions to make sure that our risk assessments are developed to keep staff and our customers safe. And yes, there are restrictions and adaptions we've had to make to our testing processes. Um, but you know, obviously. They are designed to keep our staff and our customers safe, uh, and I say they have responded, you know, uh, incredibly to the situation. Um, but yes, um, like all public services, you know, they are under pressure. They are nervous about um, the spread of COVID, and we're doing all we can to make sure that the, the processes we have in place, um, you know, mitigate against that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, um, Pat and Jeremy. Just a quick question, uh, Jeremy. The last time you were here, you referred to. Was I question you a bit on the percentage? Remember, we're down by down till 30%. It's not correct. We were down to a capacity of 30%. Approximately, roughly. Yeah. So, where do you see that now, based on the additional part talk about the 10 minutes there, sort of cleaning up time, we'll call it? Where do you see that roughly capacity now? Is that is that heading? Towards 50 per cent, or what direction we're heading on that? Yeah, I mean, we took the decision. I, I think I reported it last time that we would um, start to um, publish monthly stats because there's obviously uh, interest in it, public and political interest, on, on what we're doing. And we have seen a steady increase in terms of the tests that we've been conducting really since we started bringing further groups back in September. Um, we estimate our current capacity for fatal testing is just over 50 per cent, uh, and certainly that will be in place from January right through to the end of March. Uh, and obviously, we're getting quite close to the maximum testing capacity based on the current COVID controls that are in place uh, and the necessary adaptions we've had to make to our testing processes. So I estimate at the minute it's it's just over 50 per cent, and that's certainly what we've modelled for the next three months. Okay, and just just a, a same point here referring to. Uh Heavy goods, vehicles, trailers, and buses. We had the RHA in here a while ago, a period of time ago. Obviously, the delays for lorries, all that. I know they have other issues at the moment, but is that is there a delay in that, or where, where do you see that as heavy goods side of it all? Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, we, we had very um, positive engagement with the uh, Logistics UK and the Road Haulage Association when we reinstated testing um, back in September for heavy goods vehicles, uh, and there was some issues around the booking services and the reinstatement of standing appointments, um, but we have worked with them, and across all test centres now, um, we are delivering tests, and we are back to sort of pre-COVID levels as far as testing for the heavy goods vehicle industry is concerned. Um, I don't know, Pat, if you wish to add anything to that. Yeah, um, th th that was the one industry that we were very keen to work with and accommodate as best we can because we uh, understood the frustrations that they had, particularly those, uh, at those uh, parts of the industry which were maintaining the vehicles. Um, whenever we got back up and running, um, we were only able to offer appointments one month in advance, and that wasn't particularly helpful for uh, a company who was trying to put in a maintenance program, um, and they wanted to get back to the three months in advance, which was the pre-COVID arrangement. And we worked very, very quickly uh, with them to do that. So essentially for the heavy goods vehicle industry, uh, lorries and trailers, um, they are now operating as they were pre-COVID. Um, they have their standing appointments. Uh, we meet with them regularly, and uh, we've been in contact with them, um, either individually or collectively, um, to uh, make sure that uh, everything that they need, they have to ensure that their vehicles are kept safely on the road. Okay, D just on, a, on, on the, the TC's issue, so let's say my vehicle, for example, was tested in back end of January 19, okay, and I could have got a TC in January 20, I'm now going to be tested again at 21. So it's a period of two years, ultimately, from I was tested. What is the average for vehicles? So that, that's the worst case, the two years. What's the average of vehicles you know, that haven't been tested? Is it 18 months? Is it 14 months? What's the, the, the window of time there? In the vast majority of cases, when we issued TECs, they were for a 12-month period. Yeah. And that was essentially to bring the vehicles back in uh, on the anniversary of their, their MOT due date. And that was also to try and manage the profile of our testing going forward. If we had brought them back in after six months, we would have a spike in demand at certain points in time of the year. And then we would have obviously limited demand at other times. So it was to try and manage the testing capacity. So we've been carefully managing. But for the vast majority of vehicles, they have been issued with a 12-month TEC. And the first of those, as you rightly state, will start to expire this month. And they were issued on the back end of the lift issues. Okay, and final question just on obviously driving tests for young people generally. You have to be careful because there's obviously more people than young people on a driving test. A, and the Chair of Affairs covered this. this you've talked about 21,000 and done theory tests, so you're talking roughly five months if you only had to do those. What percentage of an increase of capacity do you put in? Bear in mind you're going to get the same number of people coming in from th with theory tests. So, you know, how are you ever going to get on top of the 21,000 figure if you have the same number coming in now with theory tests? Well, I mean, there's a, there's, I suppose there's a number of angles to this. Um, obviously, we'd have to take account of the COVID restrictions that are in place and the adaptions that we've had to make, and that, and that ultimately does reduce our capacity to a point. Um, in some respects, with the current restrictions in place and theory tests have also been suspended, it's not adding to that backlog, but I do take your point that you know once uh, services resume, theory tests are likely to resume as well, and we will have to deliver more practical driving tests uh, to come out of the scenario in terms of the demand that's currently there and the measures that we've identified in terms of the recruiting additional examiners offering uh, overtime slots, evening slots, you know, Sunday open is designed to increase our normal testing capacity to bring that down as quickly as we possibly can. Do you think, Jeremy, that, that ultimately would need to be a 100% increase? Well, I mean, it is going to be... Theoretically, it would need to be a 100% increase. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, well, certainly we will need to increase our, and that is our, I suppose, our strategy moving forward to maximise the amount of resources we can put forward for, for the driving tests. And as Pat says, we are fortunate in the fact that we have dual role staff that we can utilise to manage those demands, and we certainly will do that to the best of our ability. Um, the one thing I would say about the 21,000 figure, um, not all of those people with theory tests and our, and our data shows will convert that to a practical driving test. There will be some fall off on that figure. Um, so they are ind indicative of the current position, but hard to be very exacting. So um, where do you see, Jeremy, the bottleneck? You have young people out there that have not got a theory test, okay? They're there. So where is that bottleneck going to be, and how are you going to improve that bottleneck? Because we just, if they're not in your system, you see it takes the pressure of use. But they're there, they haven't got a theory test, so therefore there's no, there's no issue with your systems. But the bottleneck is getting a theory test, therefore 
you need to increase your driving test capacity so that more theory tests can be done to get the bottleneck out of the system. Yeah, and I suppose under normal circumstances, the numbers of staff, um, numbers of candidates that are getting theory tests and the number of driving tests we do sort of are, are in equilibrium. Yes. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the it's driving going to be a bottleneck, but that's not going to show in your system. So it's what you do to, because there's going to be people shouting, I can't get a theory test. That's the next shout's going to be. Well, I think the demand for theory tests in part can uh, qualify that once, I mean, our patient view the theory test provider, you know, we're working very closely and have, we've been working very closely with them so that they can accommodate theory tests and, and they, they have resumed essentially from the 6th of July and, and we're delivering a significant number of theory tests to meet the current demand there uh, and will continue to do so, obviously, when that service can resume. I don't know if Pad, you, Pad, you wish to add on. Yeah, the, the, the issues with the theory test, um, whenever the theory test resumes, Pearson View will decide what the um, the arrangements are in their theory test centres for the number of people that can um, uh, safely do the theory test at any one point in time. Um, so that will be a matter for them. You are quite right that those people will eventually start coming through, um, but I think it is important that we recognise that this is not a, a normal year. No. Um, we are in a pandemic, and I, um, I, I don't want to create an expectation with anyone that th this is going to be something that we're going to deal with and deal with it quickly. There, there will be delays, and those delays may be significant for some, um, some prospective um, candidates. Some of them will get their test earlier than others, uh, and others are going to have to wait uh, quite some time. Um, how long that's going to be, it's very, very difficult to say um, without knowing what the volumes are going to be. Um, but I, what I would say is this, is that we will be doing everything that is within our power to minimise the inconvenience that those customers are experiencing, and we will try our best to get through those tests as quickly as we possibly can. Um, but to try and put a, 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 an end date on it, that would be purely speculative on my part. It's very difficult, even with the modelling, to, to arrive at that date. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr Beggs? <coughs> And Jeremy and Pat, thanks for coming along to give us an update. Um, I remember the last time pressing um, on the issue of additional driving instructors, and I was told you didn't think you needed them because you had the dual instructors. So are you confirmed today you ha are employing or have employed 10 more? Did I pick that up right? No, I'll just clarify that for you. Um, we, were in the, we were in the process um, before COVID um, of going through a recruitment exercise to recruit ten, uh, to, to recruit driving examiners uh, to fill vacancies that were already in the system. So we're, we're in the process of doing that, that was then um, halted because of COVID. Um, what we have done within the agency is, is we have trawled um, within the agency for staff who uh, to volunteer as dual role. Um, for and what we've got are uh, we actually got 27 applications for that, and four of those have we're, we're working with the first four, and then we're moving on to the next six. So that will, that will give us 10 uh, additional dual role. And it's to give us that flexibility within the agency, because that's one of the beauties that we have with having the dual role uh, workforce, um, that we can flex up and flex down, depending on what our demands are. Um, and th there, there is a tremendous amount of flexibility and comfort in, in that workforce arrangement. I agree in normal circumstances that that's definitely right. But would you accept that at present you're on pressure from both sides of the house, both what? testing and driver testing? We're, we're on pressure from both sides of the house, but there's also a third side of the house, and that is that with the COVID restrictions, we can't actually train driving examiners um, because it's driving instruction, and driving instruction is covered in the regulations, uh, and that makes it even more difficult for us. So we, we, we're, we're between a rock and a hard place um, in certain circumstances. Just trying to get a, an accurate feel of where we are. You've said there's 21,000 people with, with their theory test. Now, uh, that stopped, what is it, two months now? It'll be stopped for a period of about two months for certain, perhaps more, so there'll be further pent up demand. Would that be reasonable to think that? Yeah, I think it, it, the, the, the period before Christmas, there was um, you know, a suspension of theory tests, and then with the current six week uh, lockdown, it's, and, and yes, there will be people that would have normally been tested in that period will be looking for their test once uh, the service resumes. So that, is that like to have increased by? Four thousand a month. What sort of numbers? So we, are we, we could well be talking about having to deal with thirty thousand people at least before we actually get back into operation again. Is that well, possible? I suppose when theory tests um, resume, we would anticipate that the driving tests will also be able to resume. So we will be delivering driving tests, and theory tests will be happening at the same time. So the the, the number of the theory point, tests point I'm saying should is reduce. Normally, there would be. Um, 
there is a further people will, will have added to those seeking the, their theory test. There's an additional pent up demand for young people who have now reached the age of 17 and will be wanting to do their theory test. Yeah, and, and they will apply for their theory test, but we're hoping at that stage that um, driving tests are back in line, so um, yeah. we will be delivering driving tests and they will yeah. be going through the process. And I say normal, in a normal year, that would work yeah. in, in, in equilibrium. In a normal year, what is your monthly capacity for delivering uh, driving tests? In a normal year, the monthly capacity for driving tests is roughly around, all categories of driving tests per month on average is roughly around 4,500 tests a year. We, we deliver 57,000, roughly 57,000 driving tests per year. Off that, 46,000 are Category B or private car driving tests. And if, if you were allowed to reopen again on the 5th of February, and it may be a month later, we don't know, but what would be your capacity then? Um, well, if, if you're looking at uh, the theoretical capacity, uh, we, we have uh, currently we have 30, um, 37 full-time driving examiners and 40 uh, dual role driving examiners. Um, so, if, if, if you're simply looking at the theoretical capacity, you're looking at though if we round that up to 80, you're, you're looking at 400 tests per day. But th that's that's not what we're are going you prepared to, to commit away from so, uh, vehicle testing? We're we're probably looking at somewhere in. Once we get back up and running again, we're looking at between three and a half and four thousand tests per month. Um, that would be category B. That would be, uh, that would be category B. Yeah. Um, uh, and we'll have to work up to that. Um, so you're saying, even with these additional bodies you've talked about, that you still will have less capacity than what you previously had. So therefore, the the waiting list will grow. Well, what we would have said to you is that we're we're moving up to six. We're, we, we, we normally do seven tests per day. Um, up until now, we've been doing five tests per day. We're moving to six. So we are... We, we You're are increasing going, from where you were one, during the previous pandemic stage. Yeah. But my question is, yeah. what is your capacity compared to your normal capacity pre pandemic. Well, our, our capacity is probably in the region of around three and a half, three and a half thousand tests per month. You accept that's less than what it was normally? Well, th that's, that's less than what it was normally. So will, yeah. do you expect therefore the waiting list to grow? No. Well, th th well what we're doing is we are, we, are, we are employing the additional staff. So when, when the, the additional 26 staff are in place, that will then release additional staff from within the, the vehicle testing centres to do driving tests, and that will then allow us by the end, hopefully whenever we get them trained, that will then allow us to add to, to that figure. So that figure will increase beyond what our normal average okay. what capacity figure was. Do you expect to have when that happens? I would hope that when we have all, all our vehicle examiners in place, that we would be moving towards, for, for Category B driving tests alone, um, in excess of 4,500 tests per day when we have them all in place. I think certainly our ambition is to increase our tests above what we would normally do to try and address some of the backlog yeah. issues. But uh, even when the current restrictions are lifted, there will still have to be COVID controls in place as far as all our testing processes. So the, the sanitisation, the face coverings, the social distancing will still, and that will, and that necessary adaption will restrict our, our capacity to do tests. We are trying to augment that, obviously, with the resources to bring that up to somewhere near normal. And if we can exceed the normal testing capacity, we will certainly do so. But you see the difficulty I'm, I'm, I'm looking at in that you seem to be bringing up to about normal levels, and therefore you're not, not really eating away at the uh, backlog, which is likely to be 20, 30,000 uh, applicants. And again, all those other young people who haven't been doing uh, uh, driving lessons, um, you know, th 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 there will be pent up demand, and I am very concerned this could last years, not just months. Would that be realistic? As I've said, we're not in normal circumstances. Um, we are increasing the number of examiners that are available to do tests. We're trying to go above that which we normally do, but there is, there, I think it's, it's uh, accepted that there will be delays in being able to do a driving test. I, th 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 Might I think we all have to accept that. Employing even more and, and automatically going to this uh, extended working period to deal with this backlog? And we, we, we have to consider all of those options. Okay. Turn to the MOT side, side of the House and declare an interest. I'm one of those on the, on the, on the, on the, the waiting list there. Um, um, my appointment coming, coming due. Um, 
again, it's, it's, it's actually vital to the entire community to have timely slots available. You know, people may not be able to get to work. Kids getting to school, particularly in the rural community, where there's limited uh, public transport options. Um, so um, I am I'm concerned that, uh, again, there is pent up demand there. Um, what do you see? What is your normal capacity there, not per month? Uh, and what is your expected capacity, given the plans that you've put in place? Well, uh, you know, in answer to Keith's question earlier on, we estimate our capacity, certainly over this next three months, to be, you know, just over 50 per cent. And we think that that's probably our maximum capacity at the minute with the current controls we have to put in place. Um, but obviously to manage um, the capacity and the need for people to maintain, keep their cars on the road between TECs and MOTs, everybody will be legally allowed to continue on the road. Um, uh, and that will continue until such times as normal testing services uh, can resume. Uh, so in answer to your question, you will either be called forward for an MOT because we've identified your vehicle needs an MOT because it's come to the end of a 12-month TEC or falls into another category that can't get a TEC, or you will get a TEC to allow you to continue to, um, to continue to operate. And I suppose the key thing, and I mentioned it in my opening remarks, is it must be understood the person, the vehicle owner, is responsible for maintaining their vehicle. So even if a TEC has been issued, even if the car has been MOT'd, that is tested for a minimum roadworthiness standard on that day. You know, owners should be checking tyres, lights, um, regularly servicing their vehicle and maintaining their vehicle as they normally would, and don't uh, think or be under the misapprehension that a TEC excuses that level of maintenance. Again, how, how do you determine whether to issue a temporary exemption certificate? Um, <clears throat> obviously, that's an easy way to increase capacity. Don't don't test annually. Test every eighteen months, every two years, uh, uh, and that's something which you have had to revert to. So, but my question is, at what level do you offer that? Because uh, there still does need to be timely slots for those that are coming due and are going to be uh, 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 tested, so that they can apply on a timely basis and to be able to deal with someone that goes to apply for, which would normally would be a reasonable time to apply, but it's no longer a reasonable time to apply. So how do you determine what that uh, uh, extended uh, period is before you give a temporary exemption certificate? Well, I suppose in answer to your question of modelling and the fact that you know reminder notices will issue and will give you a date uh, when your car has to be presented for tests, we've done extensive work with our statisticians and looking at the resource availability we have over the next three months to ensure that we have capacity across our network to test those vehicles that are being called forward for tests so they can get it before their MOT due date or when their TEC uh, expires. Um, and I say that that modelled figure is in around that 50%, um, and that has been carefully um, looked at to ensure that people who get a reminder notice don't find themselves in a position where they can't get a test at a test centre. I, I'm alarmed at a figure of 50% because that assumes that you're, everybody's going to get a two-year exemption and you've absolutely, if you drop below 50%, cars will start coming off the road if you're only allowed to, to, to extend to two years. But that is 50% of the cars that we're bringing forward for test and the other cars will be able to continue um, on the road through a TEC. And I say that has been modelled throughout the COVID crisis to ensure that we can uh, test the vehicles that we can test and bring those categories forward. And for those that we can't, we put a TEC in place. And your modelling is looking at the number of cars coming due each month? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you to the officials for the uh, answers thus far. Um, just a couple of things. I was listening to the radio this morning around driver testing and uh, what the Minister's announcement was in terms of the plans for resumption around that, which also have been detailed here today. just want to confirm from the officials that this is all predicated on the restrictions uh, being eased. And let, let, let's take a step back here. These restrictions are in place to to help manage the spread of COVID-19 and to save lives and to protect the NHS. That's why they're in place. And I know they're having a real impact on people's lives, but it's taken lives as well. And we need to be conscious of that. So just to, to get that clarity, that th these plans for resumption of um, driver testing are predicated upon the easing of restrictions. 
And as uh, another member has uh, outlined, I can't see the, those restrictions being eased in the short term. It's going to take a while before we're going to be able to, to move back to what I understand in terms of driver testing to be close contact services. Um, so that also then goes in the same category as um, personal care and getting your hair done and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, our position in terms of driving test resumption will be pr predicated by executive decisions going forward and when those close contact services can resume. Um, before restrictions came into place, uh, as I said uh, previously, we have carried out an extensive um, review of our risk assessments to ensure that the driving test could be delivered safely. And we have consulted with our colleagues in the Department of Health um, to um, sort of present what our control measures were in place to ensure that they were satisfied that we were taking the adequate, uh, necessary and proportionate controls to deliver that service safely. So absolutely take your point that um, COVID is still very much with us and we will have to ensure the safety of, of both our staff and our customers throughout the testing process and certainly that was adhered to in the few weeks that we have been able to deliver tests since they've resumed um, and, and obviously they've been significantly disrupted by the ongoing COVID restrictions. So in answer to your question, once the executive um, say that it's safe for the test to resume, they will resume, but under the premise that there will be um, the risk assessments in place that were always in place uh, in terms of the, the hand sanitization, the face wearing of face coverings and the social distancing um, where that is possible. Thank you. And I think it's important to give that clarity because I personally don't see close contact services resuming this month, never mind also next month. Uh, you know, that is just a reality in terms of the scale of the issue we have here, in terms of the, the, the spread of COVID-19 and the lives being lost and the pressure under our NHS. In relation to vehicle testing, to, to just two things. One, a clarity that uh, in terms of the MOT, I went online um at the weekend and had a look at when my own MOT was due to expire and it, it detailed it was going to expire at the end of February. So I was like, okay, I need to go and get the car booked in to get serviced and book the MOT. Then I went on this morning and then the MOT is now set to the 28th of August, 2021. Just a clarity in terms of, and this is something a number of people have asked me because the rules keep changing around all of this. I think all of us are, things change nearly every day. That in terms of your MOT, uh, wait until you receive a letter inviting you to book your MOT, otherwise you do not need to take any action, or do you need to be going online, checking the expiry of your MOT and booking it? So that's, that's one question. And the other one is in relation to, and this was picked up uh, previously, around the 12 month uh, expiry, I understand that legislation would be required to be able to issue TECs beyond 12 months. Uh, I understand what you're outlining there in terms of your um, view that we're going to be able to start to be able to process those where their 12 month ex expiry occurs. But I, 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 I'm hesitant that whether that will be achieved and I would be looking for assurances around whether legislation is going to be brought forward to allow the TECs to be issued beyond 12 months. Okay. Uh, in answer to your first question, and maybe I'll start and pack in that detail where, where, where necessary. Um, yes, customers, um, once their vehicle is due to be brought forward uh, for MOT, will receive a reminder notice. Um, uh, the scenario that you identify on looking at the online checker, um, the way the legislation was structured, we apply TECs, and if it's a private car, it'll be we apply a six month TEC and then automatically back to back apply a further six month TEC. So that's why the change in your own position will have then pushed that forward to August. So I'm assuming that your car was due its MOT in August 2020 and it's been pushed out now for the full 12 months. Um, so yeah. customers don't need to do anything with regard to the TEC process. Um, that is automatically managed by ourselves. But for peace of mind, I know customers do go on to the car tax checker, the MOT checker, just to check the current position. But uh, the key point here is when we need to bring your car forward for test, um, the customer will receive a reminder notice for us from us about five weeks in advance of the test to enable them to, to, to book their test slot. Sure. And in relation to the 12 month expiry in the legislation? As it stands at the minute, we are not extending any TECs beyond the 12 month period. So we've been managing that throughout the COVID crisis. Um, as we move, and, and obviously as COVID restrictions change, we're currently looking at what we do from uh, the end of March going forward. 
Um, those are proposals that we're working at, and you're absolutely right. We need to seek further legal advice on whether it is possible to extend TECs beyond 12 months, if that is indeed an option that we need to consider. Um, but those are um, proposals that, that we are working on, and as soon as we have um, you know, clarity on how we're going to take this forward, we will certainly be more than happy to come back to the committee and advise you what our plans are, and, and absolutely we will consult uh, and advise our key stakeholders and our customers of the approach. But at the minute, there is no TECs that are being issued for a period longer than 12 months. And I say we've modelled the position for January right through to the end of March, and we believe between TECs and the vehicles that we can test, we can keep everybody on the road, and we have capacity to test those vehicles that will be brought forward. Okay, thank you. And just, just one last thing. Um, obviously, um, the current arrangements in Northern Ireland is you get your, your MOT done er, every year after the vehicle, I think it's four years old, that's what the arrangement is. And obviously, these TECs are being issued now. Um, up for six months and then up to 12 months. What work's being done by the department just to raise awareness around road safety? Because th there is an obligation upon motorists to ensure that their car is roadworthy, not just at the MOT, but thereafter. And I think it's important that that is raised because I know from speaking to um, sort of car garages and mechanics, their business is dropped. And I would have concern in relation to people then not getting their car properly serviced uh, and ensuring that they're roadworthy. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate uh, the concerns, and certainly we have been very mindful of this. Uh, and as, as I said uh, to Roy, um, don't, don't let customers think that just because they have a TEC that they don't have to maintain their vehicle because they're not being brought forward for test. Um, the minister has made uh, you know, several public statements around the requirement um, for owners to keep their car maintained uh, as they normally would. Um, now, I appreciate for some uh, customers they maybe aren't using their car as frequently as they would have done pre-COVID, but nevertheless, um, you know, diagnostics in cars now tell you when things need, you know, you need a service when lights are out, and people should be very, very aware of that. They should also be aware of their tyre condition, their lights, and make sure that all those basic checks are continuing to be done. Uh, we have had con consultation with the Association of British Insurers and the police, and again, they support those road safety messages. We have them on our, on our NI Direct website, and we are uh, using our social media feeds to get that message and keep reiterating that message so customers understand exactly that it is their requirement and remains their responsibility to maintain their vehicle in a roadworthy condition. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms Anderson? Um, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Uh, sorry, Chair. Thank you. A lot of the questions have been answered. But just to be clear, because I was getting a bit confused when I was hearing about the instructors, when I read uh, it mentioned in the PAC uh, about recruiting additional instructors, are we now to understand from what was said to Mr. Beggs and others that uh, the additional instructors have uh, that were to be recruited, I thought, from last September, uh, that that hasn't actually taken place yet? Uh, no, we have recruited um, at least 14 instructors. Our vehicle examiners um, have, have come into the system, have been recruited and trained in that period of time, and we have another okay. 12 that are going through their training programme now that have been uh, that have been recruited and will be um, ready for service in February. Um, so, of the 27, we have 26 in place, and Pat has already okay. outlined plans in terms of some of the temporary uh, opportunities we've provided for staff within the agency to bolster that numbers and react and respond and create as much capacity for driving tests when that service can resume. Okay. Uh, when driving tests were being conducted last year, how many tests were happening on a weekly basis? Uh, Pat, you have on a, on a monthly, uh, it's easier um, if okay. I could no, go for a monthly basis. Um, for, for Category B tests, which is the private car tests, uh, on average we would do uh, 3,900 per, uh, per month. And um, was that happening um, from the end of COVID? No, uh, driving tests were suspended. In fact, since yeah. during COVID, their driving tests only were conducted only for a few weeks uh, uh, since yeah. the so 20, we'll see, 26th we'll of March. Weeks, sorry, sorry, Chair. So few weeks I'm talking about. How many during the few weeks? And we did only have a few weeks, and that was probably as frustrating for you as, as everyone else. But obviously, the health message is crucially important. But during those few weeks, how many tests took place? Um, in well, uh, if we take it from July, uh, we we in, increasingly yeah. um, we had 126 driving tests conducted in July, 
449 in August, 2,821 in September, 2,343 in October, uh, 1,269 in November, and 1,981 in December. Uh, I think okay. the point being, unfortunately, we haven't had a, a comparative month where we can look at how many tests we can actually deliver because of the disruption to, uh, due to the COVID restrictions. Uh, but certainly the figures you know, from December you know, were encouraging based on the limited opportunity we had to you know, deliver driving tests. And when we get back to delivering a full service, I say our ambition is to increase um, the test to pre-COVID levels with the additional resource that we will bring in place. And if we can exceed that with the current COVID restrictions, we will certainly aim to do so. I think it okay, also is fair to say. Question, uh, um, in relation to PPE, last week we were informed that additional monies for PPE was requested uh, by the DVA. What's the current stock like for PPE within the agency? Um, certainly, I, I'm not aware that we have any issues with stock. I mean, that is managed at a local level by our centre managers to make sure that they have the right, you know, PPE, the gloves, the hand sanitizer uh, in place. And there's certainly no issue in terms of supply that I'm aware of, unless Pat, you have any no, anything further there? No, there's nothing. No, nothing has uh, come across my desk in relation to PPE. Um, as, as far as I understand it, uh, the centre managers are managing their PPE. Uh, the orders are going in when the orders need to go in to ensure that there is adequate supplies of PPE in all test centres. Okay. Thank you very much. All other questions were asked earlier. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Ms Kimmins? Thanks, Chair. Um, and thank you both for such a deep Like Martina said, a lot of my questions have been answered. Um, just, just in terms of the dual role, just so I have this right in my head, a dual role instructors means um, driving instructors who also uh, are able to be examiners. Is that right? It's not MOT. No, no, the MOT. no, no. It's dual role examiners, not dual role instructors. So it's a vehicle examiner or a member of our admin team that can also provide driving examining. So uh, we've oh. got vehicle examiners that are driving examiners and admin staff that are driving examiners. Okay. And it's both then that leads into my question then is, is what I was thinking. It, it, as dual role examiners will be used to try and address some of the backlog, will that affect then the MOT testing at all? Or do you think that the recruitment of new examiners will, will kind of offset that? Well, at the moment, given that uh, we're uh, running at only 50%, just over 50% capacity in our test centres, and because of the COVID restrictions, we're limited to the number of staff that we can have in a test centre for social distancing purposes, then we do have those vehicle examiners that are also uh, dual road driving examiners available to us to provide driving mm -hmm. instruction. In addition to that, we also have two teams. So we've got a team on and a team off. So the team that is off, uh, we offer them overtime on their, when they're off rota uh, to come in and do driving testing as well. Okay, no, that's good. That's good. No one, it's, it's, it's kind of it's good to see where you can pull resources like that um, to try and help with some of this. Um, the only other question I had was just in relation to it was something I raised before, and, and look, it's it's more to say are we ahead of it this time around? Um, when when we reopened for driving tests in, in, last year, some of the issues we had was like instructors couldn't wait in the test centre while um, their pupil was out on on their test. And there had been a few issues kind of getting that all uh, ironed out. So it was just the thing, is that issue all sorted now? And are we, are we kind of have everything in place so that won't happen again, that the instructors aren't kind of left standing like they, um, until for the duration of the test? Yeah, the instructors can um, use the accommodation within the uh, test centre. And we have had that risk assessed by our health and safety risk, risk assessors um, and health and safety officials. Um, there are some people who choose to stay outside uh, uh, and wait on their vehicle or wait on the test because they feel that uh, for, for themselves that's, that, that's safer. Um, but the option is there for them to use the accommodation within the test centre uh, for shelter uh, uh, whilst the test is being conducted. Okay, no, that's, that's great. Thanks very much, Claire. Thank you both for that. Okay, thank you, Mr Boylan. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Jeremy and Pat. Just a couple of points, just in relation to obviously the fixtures in last week, and they're asking or they emphasise uh, the impact of COVID on the reserves. And I might have missed this at the start, Jeremy. Just where are we in terms of the reserves itself? Can you give me a wee update on those those figures, please? 
Yeah, I mean, as, a, as I said earlier to the chair, the reserve position has certainly, um, you know, at the start of the year, it was sitting at a 37.8 million. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we have been able to um, secure some resource funding um, from the Central COVID Fund. Um, and while we have bid for a further £10 million, um, you know, in January monitoring round, uh, if we are successful in that bid, uh, I would uh, estimate that our reserves will be, you know, in a similar position um, at the end of um, April this year as they were last year. And that money has, you know, been set aside for uh, our capital works programme, our equipment replacement programme, uh, and also some of our IT uh, transformation um, projects that we've been taking forward. So, um, I say the financial position is certainly better than that reported at the last meeting, and we're hopeful that we'll almost be in a position very, very similar to where we were 12 months ago in terms of our reserves at the end of this financial year. Thank you, and I just asked the context. I asked in the context of, I know now that the 12 month TECs are up, and those those cars are going to have to be tested. And obviously, the learning interest themselves because they've got their own test as well. But to say in terms of, of the those cars that are running out, their 12 month TECs run out, have you any idea of the figures that that's going to be tested? And how does that impact in terms of your income? And have you uh, acquired that? Any, any monies to, to address that problem? Well, certainly our financial profile in terms of our bid, in terms of lost fee income for this year, was predicated on um, the, the testing we believed that we would be able to do up until the end of March. Um, obviously, vehicle testing is the significant loss of income, you know, running at around 24.6 million for the 12 months. Um, so carefully modelling that, looking at the vehicles that we can bring forward, um, you know that has already been built into um, the the bids that we have made for the funding, and you know once your 12-month TEC uh, is up, we will be bringing those vehicles forward for test. That's what's happening now, um, and equally it's the careful management of that. The numbers in terms of testing, I don't know if Pat has them to hand over the next three months, but I think we're, our testing capacity across the network for the next three months is somewhere in the region of about 160,000 uh, vehicles, uh, and that is what we're bringing forward. And for those vehicles that we can't test at this current time, um, TECs will be issued, um, but not beyond the 12 month, um, they'll not go beyond the 12 month extension time at this stage. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate all of the questions asked earlier because. It is important we get the safety message out and you have to conduct the tests in a safe manner. But uh, in relation to Mr Muir had asked the question about uh, road safety. Um, we should be still getting the message out that it's uh, a driver and owner responsibility for these cars to be road worthy, to be honest, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I take it you're working with the PSNA and all the other elements authorities to get that message still out because there may, there may be people out there um, that, that's not adhering to it, and you know, the, the um, they shouldn't be making as many journeys to be perfectly honest. And that message needs to be getting out as well. And I think you indicated that earlier on as part of your um response to Mr. Muir. Okay, you're okay, yeah. okay so you can are you finished? Me. Sort of breaking up there, so we're going to assume that that's okay. Can't hear us. We can't actually hear you. Hello, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Sorry, yeah, there was me finished. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, any other members at the stage want to follow up with any further questions? Or, um, no one, Dolores hasn't indicated. The stage. Um, can I thank you both. Um, obviously recognising that this is a fluid situation um, and no doubt we'll be revisiting this again. So I think we have to recognise that and comments which were obviously made by members with regards to the situation that we currently find ourselves in and the challenges that presents. And obviously that has um, created um, problems for yourselves which I, I know that you're trying to, to, to work through um, but thank you both for coming this morning and um, no doubt we'll see you again. Thank you, thank you Chair. Thanks. Okay, members content um, that we don't need a follow up at this stage just um, there's nothing at this stage that we, but um, we'll just keep this on, on our agenda.
Okay. Moving then to our our next item, um, at item eight, um, what we what we are going to do actually is bring all the um, the organisations together as it is the same issue, and that's how it was requested at last week's meeting. So um, we are going to be receiving a briefing from the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium, Logistics UK, and the Road Haulage Association. Um, we have the clerk's memo at page seventy two. And we ha then have um, a briefing paper from the road haulage industry at page 76. So we may need a moment um, in order to make sure that everyone gets online. So if we can tend to pause. Oh, we can switch. Are they ready? Are they ready? Okay, I think they're starting to come on now, so uh, quite a number. Um, just for members' information, we have um, seven witnesses joining us at this stage. They're all in. Okay, so they were all in, I think they were all in the waiting room coming yep. through. They're all in now. This may be a, a challenge for us. Okay, I think that's everyone now. Yes, I think that's everyone. Okay, so um, members, we have um, and can we, wel can we welcome all joining by I Starleaf. We have John Martin, who is the policy manager. Um, Northern Ireland for the Road Haulage Association. We have Seamus Lenny, the Policy Manager for Logistics UK. Ian Connolly, Director of Northern Ireland Retail Consortium. And we have Daryl Morgan, Director of Morgan McLaren. Um, Paul Jackson, Director of McBurney Transport. Patrick Deary, Director of Derry Refrigerated Transport. And Chris Lowy, the Director of Man Freight. You're all very welcome to um, our committee this morning. Um, this has obviously come about as on the back of a request from um, John Martin um, initially and obviously as a consequence of um, the issues which have been raised um, within our own constituencies um, by um, members of various associations and, um, and also from, from the media. Um, for, for context, um, with regards to um, the role of the committee and, and um, DFI, I'll just refer members to Annex A, which is um, a briefing from Assembly researchers with regards to the remit. Um, and for, with regards to the freight industry, DFI is responsible for good, good vehicles operator licensing. Um, and we don't have a statu there's no statutory um, responsibility with regards to the movement of goods. Um, and primarily these are con controlled by HMRC and it is very much a cross cutting issue and that's not to diminish it in any way. The, 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 the very real challenges which are, are being experienced um, um, by hauliers um, in the context of um, both COVID and, um, and Brexit. Um, what I will do in order to manage this, because there are seven witnesses, um, what I'll do is I'll call um, John Martin and then Seamus and Aidan to give um, <coughs> five minutes and to set out the issues. And then if anyone else at that stage wishes to, um, to say anything, they're welcome to do so. And then we will go down mem we'll go around members as they have indicated. Um, so if I can call on John, first of all, and then um, once he can concludes Seamus then and then and to save time then Aidan please. <coughs> Hello. Hello um, Madam Chairperson. First of all I'd just like to thank uh, the, the committee for um, hosting this um, session this morning. I appreciate everybody's extremely busy including uh, um, MLAs and the committee but it's very important that we are given this opportunity just to highlight to the committee uh, the issues and pressures currently faced by the logistics sector. And I appreciate the role of the department in relation to the regulation of the sector, but this is also impacting 
on the role that the department undertakes in relation to the regulation because of the pressure that's uh, uh, being faced by the sector on a daily basis. Um, we've got a lot of experts around the screen or around the table from the sector who can give you the actual impact, but I think uh, it's sufficient for me to give you an overview of some of the high level uh, issues and pressures that the sector is experiencing. First example uh, I'll give is in relation to export health certificates. It's a huge issue in relation to uh, group each collection within GB, uh, where you're collecting food products from multiple sites and the requirement to have export health certificates. This is causing a major disruption to the market from GB to Northern Ireland. And the consequences are that traders in GB are deciding to discontinue servicing the Northern Irish market or putting their supplies on hold. It is costing the sector huge amounts of money. Uh, examples include a particular haulier uh, in the mid Antrim area whose volume has reduced by 50% as a consequence. Uh, a few other hauliers who are involved in this, their volumes are down maybe 30 to 40%. Um, John, can I the percentage is. John, can I just pause you there? Can I ask yes. all the witnesses who aren't going to be speaking at this time to go on to mute? And then, just as I call you, if you can um, remove and unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Just There was a considerable amount of feedback. John. Okay. So, just high level issues, for instance, customs agents. In order to manage the process, uh, the sector requires customs agents. Currently, there's an insufficient capacity of customs agents to service uh, the sector. And we're talking about a reduced volume at this moment in time. We're talking about roughly 60% volume, but yet we're having sufficient customs. And even some of the customs agents that we do have are not competent to do the job because they've been recruited towards the latter part of last year and there's been insufficient training or time provided to enable those staff to be trained. Uh, as a consequence of some of the suppliers um, reducing the trade with Northern Ireland, uh, there's a lot of empty trailers sitting in GB. Hauliers uh, coming from Northern Ireland to GB are still fairly buoyant in relation to the trade, but once they get to GB, they depend on uh, return loads to cover the cost of the complete journey. As a consequence of the reduction in trade from GB to Northern Ireland because of all the additional uh, bureaucracy, uh, the number of back loads are being reduced and as a consequence the cost of haulage will have to go up significantly uh, to cover the cost of the empty running from GB back in to Northern Ireland. The Trader Support Service uh, is a government funded service to provide support to the haulage sector. The IT systems provided uh, through the Trader Support Service are functioning but they're very cumbersome, uh, resource intensive. Uh, Report, uh, hauliers are reporting that they have to recruit additional staff in order to service this. This is adding to the cost. Examples given to me by hauliers include a process that have taken 15 to 20 minutes to manage pre the 1st of January, can take up to six to seven hours to manage now. Okay, there is some teething difficulties, but even with those teething difficulties being reduced or eliminated, it's still expected that that process will take in the region of two to three hours. We have a huge number of examples of trucks being delayed at the border control post, particularly in Dublin, but some in Belfast. Uh, some have been delayed for not only hours, but days. This is uh, causing considerable distress to the drivers where there's not sufficient welfare facilities. Uh, it's causing drivers to reconsider whether they want to continue to work in the sector. This is placing additional pressure on the company directors and company owners and the back office staff. Now, the sector is hemorrhaging staff and it's becoming unattractive for people to work in it. I think that's enough for me just to give you that background. The, 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 the various representatives from the Holly's companies can give you more detail, but I think it's sufficient to say that the issues faced by the sector are considerable it's more than teething difficulties. What the sector is asking for is some easements 
in order for them to uh, get back up to speed in relation to the things that they have to do uh, to ensure that sufficient customs capacity to deal with the increasing volumes. And in order to move forward, we need easements in relation to the SPS checks and the customs declarations. Supermarkets are sort of the focus for attention in the media at the moment. And even with the easements, supermarkets are having some difficulties. The supermarkets have called for an extension to the easements uh, at the end of March. They're saying they will not be able to cope with the bureaucracy come the 1st of April. And that's taken into consideration that the supermarket process is one of the easier processes to manage. The impact of COVID has been significant. However, COVID has masked some of the issues in that if the hospitality sector was fully open and functioning, uh, the increase in demand for foodstuffs from GB would increase and the system wouldn't cope with that increase in demand. I think that's enough for me to say at this moment in time, Madam Chairperson. Okay, thank you. Seamus? Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thanks for your time today. Uh, and it's good, really. Um, I, I think really it's fantastic here to have, obviously, um, you know, members of myself and the RHA here, but also Aidan from the from the retail sector to give that side. But also we've got four um, excellent witnesses here as well from the sector. I can obviously outline. I think it's good for members of the committee to engage with those um, businesses today. Um, probably the first thing, really. Um, Last year, 2020, was meant to be a year of transition. Um, I think we can now say that that was really a myth uh, because there really wasn't. 2020 was a year of um, unknown, further uh, negotiating, wrangling over deals. We didn't really know what type of deal we were going to face until the last few weeks of last year. So to think that businesses and operators in the haulage sector had a year to prepare for this, uh, that's false. Um, this year, ideally, would be a year of transition and learning for us. And the result is basically on January 1st, it was like uh, the first day at school for industry, but also the first day at school for the teachers and the whole education system. And quite frankly, people have been learning on the job. Uh, it's testament, I suppose, to the, the sector and their problem solving ability that they've managed to keep things moving the way they are. Um, there are problems, and I'll, and I'll outline some of these. Uh, it's a huge um, burden that the industry has taken on its shoulders, but it's something we do as a logistics sector. We're a problem-solving sector, and that's what we've got to try and do. And we're obviously going to need help from government to introduce easements that we will need because things aren't sustainable in the long term. First thing, probably um, very quickly, is we, we do have a trade surplus at the moment. So the unfettered access from Northern Ireland to GB is there, although albeit Dublin at the moment is a difficulty with operators are, are avoiding. Um, the trade surplus is down to a couple of reasons. Obviously, um, we had the level of preparation on GB side. A lot of businesses, suppliers in GB weren't ready to service industry on this side. So there's been a suspension or a holding back of goods. Then with COVID lockdown, we have hospitality uh, and plus the movement of um, homeware, fashion, white electrical goods. Those goods aren't moving in the same volumes they normally are as well. So the result of this, and again, I think some of the witnesses here this morning can, can, can go on that, is that we've got um, more laden vehicles leaving Northern Ireland for GB than there are coming back. And the consequence of this is that operators are taking that cost on as a burden because we, it is imperative that we keep servicing the exports from Northern Ireland, otherwise we don't have the equipment to get the goods there. So some operators are having to ship equipment back empty at their own expense. Um, the delays at the moment, I think with Brexit, a lot of people expected delays, congestion at ports um, and GB. Um, that's not the case. The delays, congestion is at distribution centres, at factories, at places like this where the goods simply aren't leaving in the volumes that they ought to be. Uh, Dublin, I did hint on Dublin at the moment, um, around about 20% of trade that goes through it, and that 20% figures from the Department for Economy uh, in a recent study. 20% uh, of the trade is in Northern Ireland, um, goods using the roll-on, roll-off service, primarily um, Hollyhead, Dublin. And that Hollyhead route is vital for Northern Ireland because it's the fastest route to market for really the south of England, which is huge for our agri-food sector. The problems in Dublin, uh, the IT systems, the, 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 the UK and the Irish systems, they're not fully integrated, they don't communicate, and there's a breakdown on that. And we've, had, we've, had, we've seen a lot of IT failures on that. Also, the 24-hour pre-notification, so when food products arriving into Dublin, 
uh, Irish authorities are insisting on the 24-hour notification period, which is written on EU legislation. However, the legal minimum is a four-hour window. And that four-hour window is what DERA are doing here uh, in Belfast and Larne and Warren Point. And that's a huge help to like the retail sector and, uh, and the agri-food sector. And also, we have no supermarket easements on Dublin. Um, Dublin are also applying 30% checks on loads coming in. And as a result, the volumes are severely down on that. So I've spoken to businesses here that are sending goods out to Europe, now using the Ross Lair Cherbourg route. And then the return loads are then coming back in through Dover Cali because at the moment, UK isn't imposing the same level of checks and entries into GB. So um, they've obviously, you know, I've outlined some of the problems there. I think um, what we've got to do is is introduce easements uh, as soon as possible. We need a grace period, for example, on SPS, um, on those export health certificates initiated as soon as possible. The deadline is the 1st of April. I think we've got to be clear. We've got to avoid another cliff edge. And also there's a cliff edge on the parcel sector. Um, many of our members are involved in that sector. Some of them carry upwards of 6,000 parcels on a trailer. I think it's clear to say that we would struggle with customs entries on that. So we need a long-term solution to avoid the need for those declarations on especially business to consumer parcels. Uh, on the final point, Trader Support Service, um, we're, we need to be relieved we have that. That was a concession we got us something we lobbied for for the, probably the last year and a half. We needed government to help with this transition. Um, if we didn't have the trader support service, I think, yes, um, you know, sometimes, you know, if you don't have the right data and the right format at the right time given to you by, by various stakeholders, that, that can cause problems. But if we didn't have it, we'd certainly be in a worse situation now. But at the moment, uh, I think the trader support service has 30,000 businesses signed up to it. And to show you probably how the penny dropped on the 1st of January about the formalities on GB to NI trade is that the TSS has experienced a 20% growth in registrations since January 1st. So an extra 5,000 businesses signed up. And that just shows you, hang on GB, they, they realize that, okay, there are these formalities and hurdles. We have to jump over to send goods to Northern Ireland. Uh, and I think to date, the TSS has completed something like 90,000 90, declarations on goods into Northern Ireland. So there's a huge volume there, but it's obviously, it's going to, as we come out of lockdown, that volume is going to increase. And I suppose, you know, the last thing I would say, our industry needs all the help it can get just to make sure we can still service the economy. So thank you, Madam Chair. Right, thank you, Aidan. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairperson. I uh, will try and be as concise as possible, but there's, there is a lot to cover. Um, I think I will start with a positive, and I think it would be remiss of me not to pay a tribute to the hard work of the guys in DERA and the DAFRA officials, especially our own CVO, Robert Huey, and Deputy CVO, uh, Brian Doher, along with retailers, our supply chain colleagues, and our college in logistics, who've done a, a sterling job under very harsh circumstances. Have and have ensured that uh, food and other materials have kept flowing over this past three weeks. There's been some disruption, and, and we all uh, admit that. I think it's a little bit simplistic, though, to blame it all on the protocol. Um, there have been some choice issues, and those have been very visible. But uh, yeah, this has to be kept in context. So the average large supermarket will have anywhere between 40,000 and 50,000 product lines. There's only ever been a few hundred missing, uh, and that picture is getting better. For the reasons why, I, I need to use that sort of uh, that that uh, overused cliche of, of a perfect storm. We did have those new uh, customs requirements of the protocol, and um, they, they came in. But the, the biggest problem wasn't the customs burden themselves, but the fact that we only had a very short time uh, to get ready for the changes. TSS, as was, was mentioned there, wasn't ready until uh, the 21st of December. In fact, uh, if you look at partials, we only got the partial regulations 18 hours uh, before they, they uh, went live. And it's not like flicking a switch. People have to be trained up and has to be everyone who is involved in that supply chain needs to understand uh, those new changes. There was also a problem um, that, uh, just as, as, as Seamus was saying, a lot of people hadn't signed up for the TESS in Great Britain. There was a huge amount of communications that was done here to get ready for, for Brexit. And in GB, the focus was get ready to trade with the EU, not get ready to trade with, with Northern Ireland. And so that fell down a, 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 a bit. We also had a case where fresh food could not come across from the EU for a week because of that COVID lockdown. That not only stopped fresh goods from coming, 
but when many arrived at a very short shelf life and that meant they weren't fit for sale. Um, this time of year, there are actually a few problems with fresh food, uh, quite simply because at this time of year, we're buying in 90% of lettuce, 80% of tomatoes, 65 plus percent of fresh fruit and veg are coming from uh, the EU. So it's not unheard of for us to, to go slightly short in a usual January. But that seven days also had a knock on to GB food production. And it meant that, you know, we were chasing our, our, our tail. Um, there was also a, a tighter lockdown which meant people were not eating out, so they were buying more. And as we have seen in past lockdown, people buy stuff that they can cook at home, then freeze and, and they stock up. Um, so for example, in, in uh, so far in, in the month of January, we're, I've got about a oh, 30% uplift in the amount of, of, of mints uh, that people are, are buying. Um, plus in retail, we've had a lot of people who have been self-isolating or, or, or off. Um, so it took slightly longer to replenish the shelves. So all these factors meant there was choice issues, but it was just more complex than, than just the protocol. Um, and I have to say, you know, it is a testament to hauliers, to the, the logistics sector, uh, to supply chain and, and to retailers that we were prudent. We did work a lot. You know, people are going 24-7 to make sure that, that it wasn't worse uh, than it was. And remember, it's only a couple of hundred items out of 40,000. Uh, wasn't helped by the media. Uh, pictures of empty shelves continuing to do the story and on a on a around the clock basis. People saying that the um the supply chain was a few days from collapse. That's not helpful and, and a, you know this, this supply chain is not and has never been a few days away from collapse and I think that needs underlined uh, because it, it's simply not true and it's it's a bit reckless to to be saying that. Um, I have quotes here from our retailers about how they've been going on, but I'll, I'll leave that, maybe I'll come back to that um, during the, the other parts of the evidence. But the, the main thing is that there's a good supply of products regularly reaching stores in Northern Ireland. And the priority is that customers have access to the products that they need in a safe environment. <laughs> um, on, uh, so we're not saying they're not issues, and they clearly are. And that's why Logistics UK and members of the Northern Ireland uh, Business Brexit Working Group, including our own, the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium, since the 1st of January, we've been continuing our work uh, with uh, the Irish government. We've met with the EU, Michael Gove, Secretary of State for NI, DEFRA, DERA, Department of Economy, and, and, and others, uh, even people within the, the European Parliament, so that people understand that what we have um, is not working uh, in the way that it should. And while we are not toppling over, we will need uh, further mitigations uh, in, in the future. So what we have asked for is the Cabinet Office to set up a dedicated group that they basically drive this instead of lots of different departments doing lots of different things. The needs to do this with business and it needs to be done with us, not to us. We, we have, are the experts in this. We can help design a way that ticks the boxes as far as um, that transparency that the EU needs, but also um, reduces that burden on, on the, 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 the supply chain. Um, we do need more time. Uh, the, 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 we did not have a, a transition period as such. We did not have an implementation period and such. The fact that some of the big government systems um, were uh, only ready a, a, a week or so beforehand. You know, in business, if that was us, we would have done it 18 months two years uh, beforehand, not in, in a few days. So if the buzzword for 2020 was then the buzzword for 2021 needs to be simplification because that's what we need. We need all of these processes uh, to be uh, simplified. Now, there's some people saying, well, you know, the supermarkets have a derogation. Actually, it's not supermarkets, it's the supply chain, food supply chain. So there's wholesalers in there, there's independents in there. Uh, there it's, it's wider than just a supermarket thing. It's a, a you know, it, it just was a label that was used and sort of stuck. Um, uh, but some people are saying we can use that to set aside in whole or in part the requirements of the protocol. All of this, you know, the EU love their legal frameworks and all of this has to be done through a legal framework. So if you look at that derogation that came out on the 8th of December and was publicised with the command paper on the 10th of December by my, Michael Gove, that's actually done through the legal framework of the Joint Committee and took around eight months from, from inception to delivery on the 1st of, of, of January. So it's not a quick fix in any way to be able to set aside and hold or in part um, the, 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 the protocol. And it's, it's, that's not a precedent. Um, the precedent that is set there is that you go through the Joint Committee. And that's another thing that we're asking for is that we have a really clear way for business to talk to the Joint Committee Working Group 
to the uh, specialised committee and the specialised committee working group, because quite simply, the joint committee is done behind closed doors. We will never get in there, and that's the way it was set up to be. But those other working groups and committees, we need to be in there to say what works, uh, what doesn't. So, in challenges, in, in closing, sorry, um, there are challenges, as we have said in every meeting and every press release over the the past year. We've said there would be. Um, that has been exacerbated by the lack of a betting in or implementation period. But business is coping for the most part. Is it stressful? It certainly is. I can tell from talking to, to retailers and talking to other uh, parts of, of industry, as, as I regularly do. But we need the EU, the UK government and the Northern Ireland Executive to work with us to provide simplifications to the challenges that we face on the 1st of April and the 1st of July. The Joint Committee is there for a reason. It is there to work out these problems. And just like Oliver Twist, the Northern Ireland business community will go back asking for more and more and more until we have a way of trading that allows us to give Northern Ireland households choice and affordability, as well as keeping Northern Ireland uh, business uh, competitive. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and if I can then move now to, um, obviously, we've got Daryl, Paul, Patrick and Chris. And I'm not particular about the order, but if any of you would like at this stage um, to outline the issues that um, that your company is is experiencing, we welcome that at this point. Will I just pick on someone? Maybe on mute. Maybe just call Daryl, and then if Paul, Chris, Patrick, and Chris in that order, if you do want to. Yeah, that's okay. Hey, Darren Morgan speaking here. Thank you, Madam Chairperson and members for your time. I'm just giving a very quick snapshot of what we have found in Morgan McTernan. A uh, route to market to move Northern Ireland goods to GB market changed overnight. Unfettered access simply meant move made goods through the NA ports. This was all well and good, but we're delivering just in time goods to multinationals in GB, which expect day one, day two delivery, which is most difficult and costly. And it's all well and good as long as things move, run smoothly. There are increased costs for plant trailers, takeovers throughout the UK, particularly to achieve delivery to the South England in the London, Bristol, Swindon regional distribution centres. Imports back from GB to NA and ROA have proven to be the most challenging. In short, no companies in GB, NA or ROA were, were prepared for the layers of bureaucracy. I've attended a number of meetings and calls, conference calls pre-Brexit and never heard of traces and sheds until the first week of January. As a company to ensure we continue to provide our service for our customers in Northern Ireland, we had to ship home empty trailers. From the 1st of January to the, the first week, we shipped 70 empty trailers home. Last week it was 30. The downturn in trade is evident, with shipping companies cancelling ferries and moving ships to where the market demands which is away from the GVNA route to the ROA EU route. This is waste under easement. Northern Ireland needs more time to prepare. Most, if not all, our customers are operating under STAMI. We, like most Northern Ireland hauliers, have become custom agents and have to create customs teams. At present in Morgan McLaren, this is seven persons, but you'll have to double at least. We need more time, not only to train and recruit, but also dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. At present, most members of our maintenance and compliance department are working from home due to isolation. Last week, I had to move our compliance team across to the customs team to try and cope with demand. COVID-19 is ongoing and is greatly hindering progress on creating effective custom teams within our company. I know from discussions and working with the RHA and Logistics UK, everyone is facing the same challenges. Dara, and in particular Brian Dufer, Brian Dufer, 
has been actively engaged and is trying to find workable solutions. We all need to work together to mitigate the impact this is going to have in the Northern Ireland economy. So that's a quick snapshot of how I found it, or how our company found it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, and uh, good to see my other fellow volunteers on here. All of us I know are on suicide watch, as we call it at the moment. Um, there's very little more that, that, that I can specifically say um, that hasn't already been summed up by by, uh, by John, by Seamus, and by Aidan. Um, some of it we agree with, some of it we, we, we don't agree with, but um, the bottom line is it's it's... You know, the, on this screen here, there's people here. Where, I mean, I've spent the 40th Christmas just past there in this the Northern Ireland haulage business here, and it's been the worst ever period of, of my life, Christmas time, um, in the preparation for for Brexit. Never mind the COVID situation that we had um, running from from March last year. So, it's been a very very difficult time uh, personally and for all our people. I mean, we. We employ 800 people in, in the sector here. Uh, we run 350 trucks. We run 1,100 trailers. And we ship about 114,000 trailers across the Irish Sea every year. Um, that's the kind of volume that we did. Uh, January figures, and, and uh, we're members of the RHA, and we, we have disclosed those figures. But January, the first two weeks in January, were 24% down on movements compared to January uh, 2020. Um, We've shipped 63 empty trailers in, uh, in correspondence over with Darrell's figures. Um, but today we're going to, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have to, we're simply running out of trailers at the moment in Northern Ireland. We're going to have to ship more trailers in. Um, and that costs, somebody's going to have to pay that. The retail business, the customer, um, I don't know, but we as a haulage business can't afford to ship uh, more empty trailers into Northern Ireland. Um, I agree with what everybody said. There must be easement, there must be uh, simplification to, to hit us all with this here um, we've talked about it and we all knew this was coming four years ago but the bottom line was you know I'm saying to hauliers as well until somebody produced a set of rules the rule book um, and we didn't get that in real terms until Christmas Eve um, and the absolute lack of preparation from the UK into Northern Ireland has, has been you know it, it, it's, it, it just didn't happen and we are hauliers, all right, or logistics operators. But the bottom line is we're not customs agents. And we're, we're, we're unfortunately the fall guys. We're caught in between the two points, A and B, to supply trailers here, um, to bring product into Northern Ireland. Um, I agree with what Aidan said there was prior to Christmas, we had the COVID issues coming in from Europe. Now we're bringing 70 loads of fresh fruit and vegetables into our Liverpool operation on a daily basis and getting them across to Ireland here. That, that did impact, um, but the problem is we can't get them. We can't get them out of Liverpool and in, shipped into Dublin. Um, we're, ha we're having a, something like a 38% inspection rate in Dublin. Um, the TSS in the Northern Ireland, it's, it's a chunky, cumbersome, you know, it just doesn't work smoothly like it needs to in, in, in our logistics business, our transport business, our haulage business. Hey, we're, we're, we're an east-west mover. That's what we do. We move trailers across the Irish Sea, and now we're, we're customs agents. And, you know, trying to encourage drivers to sit for 30 hours in a cab, ask permission to go to the toilet in Dublin, it's just, it's just unreal. It's just unreal. Belfast um, is running smoother in comparison. But if you compare it to where it was in December and the 40 years previous, I mean, I can remember going back doing customs entries in 1980 and 81 and 82, fresh out of school, driving down to Newry and Dundalk with the paperwork every day um, and clearing loads. This is worse. This is much worse. This is, you know, we're back to the dark ages of 1980s in Northern Ireland here. This is the smoothest over-legislated, over-taxed industry in Northern Ireland here, that, and we are struggling. Um, I, I hear what we're saying about press and shortages and shelves, etc., etc. But we, you know, we can't get trailers shipped across the Irish Sea. Our shipping companies are 
you know, a new, brand new ferry brought in to sail Stena, Belfast to Birkenhead, taking it off. It's now on the, on the European route because, you know, they can charge much more money and they can fill the ship. But we can't fill the ships here in Belfast because we can't get the freight in. But the volumes are down. If we were running pre, uh, pre-Christmas uh, levels, it just wouldn't You'd be shipping 60 empty trailers a day to try and put a bit the shortfall here. You know, you, operations have just come on the, to me here this morning looking to ship 43 trailers in tonight. You know, we, we wouldn't get the space anywhere to ship them in, but that, that's what we're going to need here tomorrow, apparently, to, to, to run to break even here, uh, to keep the express movement going. So there must be a pavement, there must be easement, there, there, there must be joined up thinking from us all. Um, as the haulage business, as the RHB, as the um, FTA, um, as retail. Um, but we are the haulier. We're stuck in the middle of this. And we shouldn't be. We should not be stuck in the middle of this. Thank you very much, Mom and Friend. Okay, thank you. Um, Patrick, have you anything additional you'd like to add? Yes, good morning. Morning, morning Chair and the rest of the committee. Um, I also agree with what's been sent, said by everybody else so far. It is um, extremely challenging. Um, I do believe the industry in transport is going to be hit very hard financially. There's probably a few companies that won't afford to go forward on this. Um, you know, this has been been done. Um, it's been left for the hauliers to pick up the pieces, for the industry to go forward, try their best to make it work. But I do believe that it can work if if there's more engagement with the industry rather than a high-level opinion on it. Local supply has increased. Um, the likes of Lidl's um, would buy a lot more local supply than ever, and um, they almost have. You also see the likes of Daddy Lights winning contracts with Boots Chemist. So there is, there has been some very much uh, win for, local, for the local economy going forward, but I do agree with the rest of our colleagues that it is, it is very, very difficult um, we have been working very closely with Brand Doer. It is working going forward. We have to make more and more tweaks. And possibly going forward, eventually it will work. But the time frame for the local hauliers um, to make that work is a, is a different question. Um, how does that stand? I do think there needs to be a, a financial support for the hauliers, for the amputeers coming back in. There's not enough profit um, in the business to send trucks out full and come back empty, it just doesn't financially pay. Um, and that is going to be a very big problem in the industry and going forward um, as we struggle as it is on prices of fuel, shipping, um, staff. And I do think that needs to be raised as well. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. And then Chris? Good morning, Madam Chair and Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I speak to you principally as a haulier, but also I have an interest in customs. In the first week of Brexit, we experienced severe delay and poor communication as an industry from both the providers of the customs services and also from the departments because they were not refused enough at the time. We were the first vehicle off the ferries on the 1st of January in Northern Ireland, and we were the first vehicle stopped. Why we were stopped, we're not quite sure. We were held for over three hours, and we ended up having a brand to her involved who clarified the local vet in Belfast that she was incorrect in what she was doing. We were then able to proceed with the press product, which was put into a factory in Craigavon to go back out that evening to go to retail stores in GB. As a whole year, we export from Northern Ireland principally fresh produce. What we bring back in is finished goods retail and also parcels. We have seen a drop off today of about 100 loads per week on return journeys from GB. That impacts upon our bottom line directly to a value which makes the business unstable. On the second week of January, I took the initiative. I went to England. I went to one of the new pop-up clearance customs houses that employed over 50 people that had invested heavily in robotics to do the transactions of declarations. The robotics didn't work and still don't work. uh, The headcount was 50 they're trying to scale up to 150 because the robotics aren't working 
because nobody fully understood the complexities or demands of the industry for the movement of goods from GB to ROI, ROI and NI. As lately as half past two this morning, I was talking to the teams over because we've left implants, our own people, to service our own customers on the movement from GB to NI. My team over there are learning today from the people there who have only really been employed in the last 20 days. This industry of customs didn't, didn't operate. It hadn't been operating for over 26 years. In that time frame, the people who were customs operated had retired and left the business community. The customs people that popped up believed that they had the capacity and they had the knowledge and they could be, bring people to industry to provide us with the link that we miss at the, most, at the moment. When I was over there last week, I uh, spent many hours in the office, generally about 18 hours in their offices. They've been hit heavily with COVID. GB and COVID at the moment is rife. 50 people, there were 40 of them, had to be go and get testing. That left that on one night, there was only three people in the office to handle all the decorations to go through their business, which is 5,000 decorations per day. Impossible. This is causing errors in how to decorate the product. It's causing issues at the ports when we arrived there because the paper is not correct. And as late as last night, one of the new pop-up customs agents has told me that he is no longer going to serve the island of Ireland, as in ROI, because of the complexities of the using seven different systems to make a transaction to move product of retail to ROI. He believes, because he's moving the product into GB and the NI, that he will have the same situation come April. So what we're seeing in the at the moment, it is correct. Nobody's going to starve in this country. Thank God that day's gone. But when I was in England, rather than eating hotel food for the full period of over eight days, I went to some of the stores, paying a piece of marks of that today. And I can assure you that the availability in the lines that they've had available in GB is not available in the NI. And I haven't seen available since before Christmas. So yes, we're not starved, but we do have the same availability, and we are still part of the kingdom, I believe. So this one time, I am asking, as a haulier and a person who understands the customs, an easement, a period where you build infrastructure. The companies that are speaking to you today as hauliers have built up their businesses over maybe for 40 years, and have infrastructure behind them, and that's why they're successful. This is not successful today because there's no infrastructure behind the customs, there's no knowledge base behind customs. The systems have not been stress tested or have realized the total capacity required for movements on a daily activity, bearing in mind that we're retail driven and we have a peak in a trough a day. So in the 24 hour clock, the demand in the systems is not constant. In reality is it is a 60% demand over a five to six hour window. The businesses that have set up the customs weren't aware of this year. And when they talked to us openly, they said the customs in the rest of the world, apart from Dover and Northern Ireland, is a nine to five job because it principally it all moves in container ships and can take six weeks to move across the channels. So there is no pressure on them like there is today. So we have a severe resource issue, which is having a knock on effect on our ability to be efficient in our industry, which is looking like we have done our figures for the first 20 days of January, and we're going to have to go to Northern Ireland, PLC, our customer base, and say, as exporters, we are in demand. We need to move your product out. You need us to do it. We're shipping empty chillers in. We're going to ask them for a 12% rise on the current rate structure that they're paying. That will leave Northern Ireland, PLC, ineffective in the marketplace against the GB manufacturer producing the same goods at the same the quality level. So we have, yes, there's stress involved in every one of us today because we understand our business. We've seen this perfect storm as yet included to coming. I was quoted in the Garden newspaper two years ago by Polly Tumbleby, quoting what has happened on the shelves today. Not that they're going to be empty, but lack of availability. Also, additional cost to everybody. I'm sorry, that's my point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I suppose really we'll, just, we'll, we'll move then to questions and I mean, all members will... Have, have indicated so I, I'll, I'll I'll put my questions together and really just 
allow whoever wishes to answer, obviously can just maybe indicate and just raise their hand just for, for ease of, of managing the session, if that's okay. Um, um, first of all, can I just commend um, all of you in re with regard to, to the work that you have carried out, particularly um, from the early part of last year and the challenges that you were presented um, by COVID. Um, and that hasn't been easy. Uh, and certainly what has happened then since has, has, has made that much more challenging. But um, really just to commend you and your drivers um, for ensuring that we do have, have stock on our, on our shelves and keeping things moving um, for us within Northern Ireland. And that hasn't been in any way easy. Um, I suppose really the, the, the key from all of this is the need for simplification and easement. And I suppose I'd, I'd like to have a, a better idea of the conversations um, that you have had, particularly those who are the representative organisations um, with, with other departments um, and those who um, can bring influence on this. Um, obviously TSS has played, played a role and has been, has been key and um, while I appreciate what you've said that it's positive that they're there and it has been cumbersome, um, just to know whether or not they have given a commitment to looking at re refining their processes to help make things a little easier for you. Um, and also around the challenges that you do have, we had, as a committee have had numerous discussions around support for hauliers and um, particularly around COVID and there weren't seemed to be um, exceptional or particular circumstances which allowed the box to be ticked in order to assist. Obviously the, the Secretary of State has um, placed COVID very much in the centre of this the situation that you have and, and I was wondering whether or not any representation had been made directly to DFI um, with regards to support because all those who have um, spoken from college have, have mentioned about the the empty trailers and so on that are coming back from, from um, the mainland be that because of um, COVID or because some of the challenges that in regard to being ready for, for Brexit. So really just want to explore whether or not those representations have been made and um, what assurances you've been given from those you have spoken to with regard to making things easier. Will I call John or, or Seamus on some of that? <coughs> Um, yes, Madam Chair, I'll just, I'll just come in first. Um, the first issue on Trader Support Service, um, we are engaging with them. We do need, obviously, future improvements on that. So we've been assured that there will be um, additional development on the groupage model, because groupage is very cumbersome. It's one thing to put an entry through for one consignment on a trailer, but if you're trying to put entries through maybe for maybe upwards of 60 or 40 consignments on a trailer, it's a lot more difficult. So it, was, it wasn't really designed initially for groupage, but we've been assured that there will be developments soon on that to improve that. And also on the transit, um, so this is moving goods basically um, via Northern Ireland or the Republic of Ireland. So Irish Revenue Customs um, gave very clear definitive guidance last week on moving goods from ROI to GB via NI. Uh, and I've obviously been pressing HMRC and TSS for similar come in the other direction. So um, Trader Support Service have said that there is guidance now imminent. I've got a, an outline of how that will work. Uh, and that's pivotal because a lot of the freight, especially stuff coming into um, Warren Point, for example, it's natural hinterland is, you know, a lot of it's South Ulster, North Leinster, um, but also even coming in through Lauren, Cairn Ryan, there's a lot of operators here being moving goods to Donegal, Monaghan, other places like that as well. So we need that guidance soon to ease that, that burden. Um, on representations on the on the cost, um, I've certainly outlined the concerns, the pressure, the financial pressure that operators are under on moving empty goods to the cabinet office. Uh, and government are, are aware of these pressures at the moment. Um, so we, we do have future meetings with um, with the government on these on these things, on what type of mitigations, and obviously that's something that Treasury would have to get involved in as well. Uh, and probably, I think it's been notioned um, on the on what we're trying to do solution-wise. Um, it was mentioned there about DARA officials. I, I, would, I would have to join, I suppose, my colleagues and, and commend in DARA on this. Um, the chief and deputy veterinary officials have been extremely helpful on this. 
And we've taken basically, you know, an approach of solution led. So um, uh, w one chink of light, I suppose, this morning is that the first trial load of um, SPS groupage arrived into Belfast at 7 a.m. this morning from Liverpool. And uh, I've just received confirmation probably in the last hour that that worked all fine. Um, so that's the first run. Um, we, we can't get too carried away with that. I think we do need more trials and we need to refine this. DEFRA are very keen to issue guidance to industry. Um, I, I've obviously said, listen, let's not get too excited. I would like to see some more runs of this. So I've got um, a few members um, involved on this. And, you know, I have to commend them on this and just, you know, pushing forward and ultimately being pioneers on this um, because there was a lot of work involved in this. Um, so we're getting there, but um, obviously, you know, talks are ongoing with government on these easements. Aiden, you're on mute. Aiden, I'm not. <laughs> you're okay. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yep. Sorry about that. Um, so just just two quick points as far as representation is concerned. Um, we're well aware of of, of what um, th that different people have different responsibilities in in this, including from the the, the department. But just on on the wider um, points. With the Irish government, what's happening at Dublin Port uh, about movements, about the uh, how um, uh, hauliers are being treated, and also, uh, and, and, and very importantly, uh, at the 24-hour notification period, um, I'm in the middle of, on behalf of the Northern Ireland Business Brexit Working Group, pulling together a paper um, which sets out why uh, that is, is, is needed, um, and putting it very clearly that this, um, while affecting the haulage industry and the logistics industry, has wide-ranging effects across um, the Northern Ireland economy. Uh, we're hoping to have that finished by uh, the middle of next week and, and out to them. The other thing that we're working on is um, uh, the, the business working group, or the business Brexit working group, um, put together responses to the Northern Ireland command papers that the uh, Cabinet Office uh, wrote. Um, first, we had 67 questions to be answered, then we had 82 questions to be answered. Now, a lot of them have been answered now, so what we're doing is being pragmatic, as we always are, going back and saying what is working, um, what is good, but also then showing where the gaps are. And we're going to send that uh, to the EU and to the UK. But in all of these things, it's based on, on, on trust. Um, and that trust needs to be rebuilt. There is quite a bit of, of friction there still uh, between the EU and, and, and the UK. All that we can do is, is to um, give you our reassurance that we will continue to plug away at this. Right, I, I'm, just very quickly then, can I ask about the, obviously the welfare of, of drivers um, and no doubt the fact that they are having to stay um, close to their lorries and their cabs for um, for long periods of time. Um, is there any, are there any improvements which could be made locally which would, would help them? Um, and certainly any representation that could be made um, either to uh, sort of across the water or, or um, Dublin, which will make things a little easier from that perspective. Um, and also, have you encountered any issues with regards to having the need for COVID testing for, for members who are have, or drivers who are having to then go um, across to France and further afield? Madam Chair, I suppose um, I, I'll start that. Um, yeah, um, we do have instances. We have, we have operators now sending loads out Ross Lair to Cherbourg and Dunkirk. Obviously, French authorities are expecting uh, a negative COVID tests uh, taken within um, 72 hours prior to arrival. There is no facility here for drivers uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, I have spoken to DFI and Department for Health last week on a facility for here. Um, but in the meantime, after speaking to some of the ferry companies, the Irish government have taken the decision to offer HGV um, driver tests at Dublin and Rosslare. So we're just waiting for confirmation on that because um, obviously we have the testing sites in GB. That, that's a problem for anyone going out through Dover because if they get to England and they test positive, what do they do then? They're in a, they're, they're in a, they're in a situation where then they have to return home because they won't be able to enter France. And obviously we need something local, something local ideally for people going GB to continent, but also guys um, using the Ross Lair route as well. Okay. Um, I mean that, that would be a concern and, and um, I seek members. Um, approval that we do write to both DFI and to um, Department of Health with regards to that to look at something um, to be in place in Northern Ireland because the worst situation would be that they would be then left stranded um, and then 
finding it very difficult then to, to get back home again. Um, thank you. Can I then ask the Deputy Chair, Mr David Hildage? Thank you, Chair. And I would like to commend you at the outset for, for having made such representations, both uh, in uh, London and here in Northern Ireland as well. You've certainly been hitting the right doors and trying to get answers. Uh, I don't think you'll find any opposition at this committee either in relation to your cause. Uh, it, at the outset there, there was mention of health certificates was causing a major situation. Uh, could somebody tell me a wee bit more about, about the health certificates, which I think did a th pick up that were had to be issued at the supplier then, was it? So any, um, I suppose, uh, just to give you the, the legal context of it, um, any product of animal origin has to have a, an export health certificate that is signed off by a, a, a veterinary officer. And basically what it says is that what you're sending uh, to Northern Ireland is um, the right standard for consumption, or if it's pet food, it's, it's not full of creepy crawlies and all sorts of bad stuff. Um, the export health certificates um, usually cost anywhere from about £80 to £200 would be the top level. At the moment, we only need to export health certificates um, uh, for products of, uh, of, of, which are on the prohibited and restricted list. Um, those are ones that normally would not be allowed into uh, the EU from a third country, which, um, for all intents and purposes, GB is at, at the moment where we're uh, administering the single market uh, regulations. Now, at the moment, you do not need an export health certificate for every product, only for the P&R list. What you do need is a simplified certification that does not need um, that, that, that sign-off. Now, come the 1st of April, and we're already uh, about a, 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 an eighth of the time through uh, the, the period, um, we will need to get a simplification or a derogation from the Joint Committee, which will enable us to, uh, to you know, not need export health certificates on everything. Um, there is going to be a movement assistance scheme, and that will pay reasonable costs, um, is what the Cabinet Office paper puts it as, um, towards export health certificates. They'll pay up to £150 plus VAT, which goes to the VAT who is going to be signing things off. However, it is an extra level of bureaucracy. It is going to make things harder. And that's why we have said that we need the EU, UK, Northern Ireland Executive to sit down with business because that's one of the problems with what has been given to us before is that it has been done to us, not with us. This needs to work for the retailer to the haulier to the guy who's packing the shelves. This all, all needs to work. Um, so uh, what we need for them now to do, and I'm talking within weeks, is to sit down and look at solutions, solutions that provide that key buzzword of simplification. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was an indication as well of the loss of employment in the in the industry, the haulage industry in particular, uh, due to people just not wanting to get involved in it. Now, would that be down to this new system in particular, or is that a general theme within the industry? Deputy Chairperson, can I answer that question? Our industry, the average age of employee as a driver would be 54 years of age. We have a good retention of staff, and the drivers that we have have a great knowledge base, not just of our business, but of our customers' businesses, and we rely on them to support us in servicing our customers. We have suffered with COVID, um, no testing facility for new drivers from the industry in the last number of 10 months. In that time frame, unfortunately, people have had an age profile and have left industry. Our drivers at this one time will work taking them by the hand, and we have today close to 390 drivers. We're talking them through the situation of this new world, and we're trying to explain to them that we are working with people and companies such as yourselves to try and make their job a lot easier. But to put in context, we export from Northern Ireland and we return with a, a full trailer back in again. The average time between the delivery and collection is 11 to 12 hours. That's giving them legal break in compliance, redirect themselves to a collection point and return it home. Due to the and there's a confidence in GB in our marketplace, we're seeing back loads have dropped off, which everybody has said at the table here. We're holding the drivers waiting for loads that we hope for later in the day, and it's up to now twenty two hours average waiting time for drivers. That's twenty two hours sitting in a cab with nobody to talk to other than a mobile phone. Facilities, if they're lucky, to have a microwave and a pitching pack in the lorry, 
and when they go to service in GB, they're charged extortion prices for facilities actually are closed. No showering, no, no toilets is basic. So to attract people in this industry at the one time is very difficult. We're not seen as an industry that attracts people readily. They have to have a history in the industry. Their fathers, their grandfathers, their uncles have driven flowers before. That attracts them to it. They enjoy it. They excel in it. And they give us a great, stable workforce. But at this one time, no new recruits coming in due to COVID. Age profile people are dropping out. And the ones who are at it are saying, we'd be better staying in Northern Ireland, not crossing the channel at all. So it's going to have a different impact upon us whenever things do pick up again, as Paul alluded to, because we are still in a quiet period. January is a quiet period for us. February, you had Valentine, then you have Easter. We are also a seasonal driven business where we need to flex to scale up and scale down. Hope to answer your question. Okay, thank you. That's certainly a worrying aspect of the whole thing. Uh, just out of interest, I think one of the uh, companies there had indicated they had uh, within the first two weeks about 100 empty trailers lying across in GB. What sort of price is on bringing back an empty trailer? What's the cost of bringing back a trailer empty? Uh, all right, Daryl, you're not going to answer that question. <laughs> Neither am I, to be fair, uh, on the open forum, uh, by, by Chairman. Um, uh, every one of the companies around here are competitors, to be fair. We're all involved in the same industry, and every one of us would have a different uh, route. But the bottom line is there are some figures, uh, speaking to some of the hauliers, but let's just say it's, it's well in excess on the, on the short fee corridor of £100, and in the central corridor, an access to two hundred pound. Um, so that kind of number, and with with what uh, Morgan McLaren said and what we have said, I don't think anybody would want to get into a specific cost. But that's the kind of number. It's it's a crippling number. I mean, certainly we 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 looked at our first week's figures, and for a week beginning the fourth, the first full week of of the uh, new Brexit. And we calculated between sixty-seven and seventy-three thousand pound of additional costs in that week, and that was a week of extreme drop volume in comparison to where it had been uh, in the previous January. So uh, you wouldn't want many weeks of what we've just had, and this is where it's extremely urgent that we plug this, we simplify this um, for everybody's, you know. Uh, peace of mind. There's nobody, certainly, I, you know, I, I, some of my colleagues over here, if I had worked harder at school when I was a 16-year-old, I certainly wouldn't be in the mess we're in today in this industry. Anybody at 57 years of age, there won't be people in the industry in 50 years from now with 50, 57, 58 years of age that have been 40 years in the industry. They won't do it. There's nothing to attract young people in this industry. And what Northern Ireland really has to remember as well is Every single thing that you buy in this country comes in on a set of wheels, right? Whether it's an aircraft land in Belfast with a set of wheels touching the tarmac, it has to be delivered on a courier van to you. If you buy online, it has to be delivered with a courier. It has to be brought from one DC in the UK into here. It has to come on a set of wheels. Um, irrespective of how we get it here, it comes on a set of wheels. And uh, nobody, you know, I agree with what, what uh, Chris Slowey just said there. We can't attract staff at the moment, and certainly COVID's not helping us either. End of the bargain. Okay, thank you, and thank you for coming before us today, and certainly appreciate the difficulties that you're facing at the moment. Thank you. I am um, just conscious, actually, that um, John Martin has sort of fallen out of the spotlight. John, do you have anything that you'd like to add to any of those questions? Uh, at this moment in time? Ap apologies, Madam Chairperson, but my internet is unstable at this moment in time. But I just want to cover off a point in relation to um, drivers and uh, COVID tests. We have been engaging with the health service in Northern Ireland. We've done a survey of our members to identify the volumes, and we're trying to put a business case together for the health service in order to provide something uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, so that's that's currently ongoing. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Mr Boylan? Oh, hello, yeah. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, I can. Thank you. Just, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here today in the presentation, mate. Just a couple of quick points. Um, 
Aidan, you're welcome back. I'm, I'm disappointed you haven't got your big hat on you there. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, you said there in relation to that the protocol wasn't the only disruption. Do you want to elaborate a wee bit on that? Yeah. Right. So, uh, I'll, I'll have two other questions. I'll ask them to you, and then I'll go back to the hauliers. Um, say in terms of the committee, just what can we do as a committee to help us? And also, moving forward in relation to northern businesses and i know it's a difficult time now but in terms of them accessing the market you know what's the challenge that lie ahead first just those three questions to yourself first okay um so on on uh the, the protocol um the protocol is part of this but we do have that perfect storm um that we are in a lockdown and lockdown we you know we don't have to cafes and restaurants open so we are more reliant on our supermarkets people are buying in a way you know there has been some overbuying as we call it we don't like to call it panic buying but it's overbuying um, and you know mints has been up about 30 35 percent year year on year and it, gets, it shows you the, the sort of stuff that that has been uh, missing we have seven days when we couldn't get food gb to e or eu to gb and that meant that it wasn't coming to northern ireland either but it also meant that there was a knock-on because those factories in in, in uh, gb who were waiting on ingredients couldn't get the stuff um, and that is that's why it sort of trailed over uh, as well there has been uh, some uh, disruption with a lot of gb suppliers not having the same uh communication as there has been with Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has been be prepared to send things and get things from GB. The big emphasis with um, with uh, GB uh, companies was to prepare to send to the EU, uh, but forgot about uh, poor, poor Northern Ireland. And, and, and that's where a lot of that has come. Now, it is getting better. Uh, there is still a need for an education piece. Um, and the cabinet office have promised us that they are uh, going uh, to do that as as uh, as a, a, a matter of urgency, um, and you know the, all of these things sort of um, I, I keep using the, the cliche, but it is a, a, a perfect storm, not of anybody's making. One of the biggest things is that if we were doing these sort of fundamental changes, you're not talking about one. Um, new IT system. You're talking about four new IT systems. You're talking about um, lots of of, uh, of of customs code for every item of those forty or fifty thousand that is coming in. That's in a, a, a typical supermarket. Each of those needs a customs code. Some of those will need merging codes if they're made up of particular uh, in, in ingredients, and that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of man hours. After a while, you get used to it, but at the start, there was uh, that friction. And again, I'll go back to the point that while um, there's a lot of coping, and I use that in, in sort of an, in inverted commas, uh, because it's very clear to hear, uh, not just from the logistics guy, but everyone in the supply chain, that there's a lot of stress, a lot of unneeded stress, uh, because we didn't have a transition, we didn't have an implementation period. It was a couple of weeks. So what we need this year is simplifications. As far as the committee is, is concerned, um, we really need you guys, uh, firstly, to be shouting out from the rooftops about um, the, the uh, case of, of, of hauliers, um, not just to uh, the UK government, the Northern Ireland Executive, but to the Irish government as, as well. The health and well-being of the guys who are in our supply chain is, is, is paramount. Um, you know, it, it, there is one thing about on the shelves and stacking the shelves, but the guys who move the stuff, they, they are the veins and the lifeblood of our business, and they need to be looked after. It, it, it's that simple. The other thing that you could do is to make sure that the executive are putting pressure on both the EU and uh, the UK to look at those um, cliff edges that we're seeing on the 1st of April on EHCs and on the 1st of July. That's, that is unbelievably important. When the First Minister and Deputy First Minister sent that letter to Sefovich, the, uh, Vice President Sefovich, uh, about getting food to Northern Ireland, that made people sit up and listen. Because people who are diametrically opposed on the Brexit issue come together for the welfare of the people of Northern Ireland. And I think that's where we need to get to with the whole executive outline how we need simplifications on this. As far as businesses, you know, they're just going on the backloads issue. Um, you got to remember that an awful lot of our businesses are closed at the moment. Once they open up, there will be more to and fro, and that should ease some of that. There will also be a reorientation of the supply chain, as there always is. The, the supply chain 
Um, there's an old saying that the supply chain will always take the path of least resistance. So there will be new opportunities um, to, to, uh, to, to, to happen uh, in, in the future. I think at the moment it's about giving uh, the logistics industry the support that it needs to get through the next six months, eight months, ten months until the new normal settles in. I think that's really important for a month. Thanks very much. And just to Hollies, I know I want to thank all the businessmen that's come to give your presentation, but probably to, to John and Seamus, these questions will apply, but if anybody wants to respond, they're more than welcome. Just in relation to the current problems, I mean, are most of them of a, of a technical nature and is it something officials can, can uh, sort out, just if you'd like to expand on that? In relation to the communication from both sides or right across the board, how is, how is the communication? And, and finally, I know Seamus, you mentioned the groupage issue. Um, and you would like to expand on that in terms of IT-based proposals, and maybe you'd like to, to give us a wee update on that and how you get on. But sure, I know other members are keen to ask questions, so I, I leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Boyle. Uh, I'll just answer very quickly before John come back. Um, uh, on the on the SPS groupage solution, um, so the obstacle to that, a lot of that service pretty much suspended um, because it's 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 legally uh, impossible to to have that business model at the moment with sealing trailers, etc. Um, so basically, a couple of operators have came up with the idea of pretty much like the way we would move bonded goods. Um, instead of sealing the trailer, you see it seal the pallet. So what we did um, yesterday is that um, we, we had a uh, haulier going to premises in GB, collect um, pallets that are then have uh, their, their shrink wrap and then a secure seal with a seal number put on it. And that's signed off by the OV, the official veterinarian on the site. Um, and then basically you go into the IT system, the traces system, and there's a document called a shed, the common health export document that is linked to the manifest in that particular lorry coming in. So DARA know that when the lorry's coming in off the ferry, they know exactly what is on the back of that Group H lorry uh, and the references, you know, who it came from, what it is, where it's going to. And it's that type of oversight. And that's something that satisfies the, the commission. And um, first of all, you know, I suppose um, the, the load came in this morning and that came in satisfactory. There's still some learning to go with that. Uh, and I think we need, you know, there, there's a few more trial loads due this week. Um, so that's where we are with that at the moment, with the solution. Um, I, I think with the problems we're experiencing at the moment, um, a lot of this comes down to the, the last minute nature of, of the, the agreement, the deal agreement between the UK and the EU. So people just simply didn't have the guidance, what I mentioned at first. We didn't have time. There was a rush on webinars. You know, there's probably a webinar every other day um, during the month of November for businesses to train. Um, so we're pretty much people are learning on the job at the moment. And actually, I spoke to um, a large business here this morning. And their feedback to me is that their inbound service levels are bumpy. So they're having good days, they're having bad days, but they're seeing some improvement. Uh, and where that improvement is coming from, it's where GB businesses are now starting to understand the regulations. And that's a common theme is where I think a lot of businesses in GB just weren't aware of the obligations that they were mentally tuned into GB EU, but not GB Northern Ireland. So um, we've been pressing government obviously to improve that message to businesses uh, in England, Scotland, Wales. Thank you. And John, the technical issues and, and others, and if any is want to comment on how the committee can help as well, sorry. Without going into the detail of what Seamus has already covered, yes, there's been big issues in relation to the SPS requirements. And as, as Seamus has alluded to, there has been a trial this morning. It was a fairly straightforward, simple load this morning. And I think there'll need to be more trials in relation to more complex movements. But things are moving forward. Uh, people are raising issues with me in relation to has there been actually a risk assessment undertaken of the risk posed to the consumer in Northern Ireland as a consequence of uh, food coming from GB. Uh, I've, I had the phrase used, if a product's good enough to consume in Cairn Ryan, should not be good enough to consume in Belfast or Larne. Uh, I think there needs to be a look at actually what are we trying to protect here. We need to go back into the technical requirements to see if it's actually necessary. Has there a risk assessment been undertaken uh, going forward? In relation to 
logistics in general. I have uh, requested some relaxation in relation to drivers' R requirements. Uh, as the operators have alluded to, everyone in the sector is under significant pressure. Uh, Morgan McLernan have indicated that they have had to move staff from their compliance team to support their customs team. Um, as a consequence, drivers' hours are a big issue. Uh, drivers are sitting in locations for extended periods, so there needs to be some relaxation. The DFI have come back to me to challenge me on developing a business case. Uh, and I'm, I'm in the process of consulting with members to see if we can put a business case together. But any support the committee could provide in relation to a, a relaxation along similar lines that we had at the start of COVID would be uh, very welcome. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ian Watts. Ian, we can't hear you. You must be on mute. Apologies for that technology. Um, I just need to come back on what John said there about um, the, the technical requirements being the same. He's actually absolutely right about that. However, there isn't a legal framework, and this is where it comes back to the legal frameworks in, in this stuff. There's no recognition of that uh, being the same. And the reason why we have that solution for retailers in the wider supply chain is because there's a guarantee within the 8th of December joint agreement uh, between the Joint Committee, uh, led by uh, Mr. Govan Safovic, that there would not be any um, divergence within that time period. And that's the only reason we were able to do that. It does not matter if you have exactly the same, if it's copy and paste, if there's not a mutual recognition within that. Um, then it doesn't matter. It, it's, 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 you know, you, you could have a newspaper and a comic on, on one side or the other. They just won't recognise each other. The legal framework with, within this and what we wanted to see within the TCA, and everyone's calling it a free trade agreement, the trade and cooperation agreement isn't actually a free trade agreement. It's an association agreement under Article 207 of the Function of the EU Treaty. Um, and, and that's a lot looser than a free trade agreement. So what there's a worry about is divergence, and that's where the trust has broken down already, because we've already seen within the Parliament people talking about divergence on herbicides, divergence on GMOs, divergence on plant materials, and all these things are real red flag issues to the EU. So it doesn't matter whether you have exactly the same regulations unless you have a legal framework to say that you will not diverge and that recognises the, uh, the same qualifications, the same uh, rigorous checks and the same uh, single market regulations, then there is always going to be a problem with that. It is not just um, a, 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 an instant recognition or an instant um, reciprocal arrangement. That, that's not how um, the EU key work. It's, it's not how trade law works. Okay, thank you. Um, James, can I just go back to the point that you were making around Great Bridge? There was obviously uh, an expectation of an announcement at some stage today from DAFRA in and around that. And I was just curious as to whether the test um, tri or trial that took place this morning, whether that was to feed in um, to that um, and what it was actually that you were then expecting from, from DAFRA. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, uh, DEFRA obviously um, uh, anticipating that they will have guidance to give to industry this week. Um, I've made it clear really we need to manage expectations and I, I would be hesitant to get guidance out to industry, both the logistics and the, the manufacturing and, and food and drink sector, uh, until basically we just you know, get the fine detail on this. So we've done the one trial, that's worked well. Um, now we're just having a few more this week. I would rather if the guidance, if we, um, you know, it's, it's that old saying, you know, measure twice, cut once, that we need to do that. So I've just kind of said, just hold back on that guidance just for an extra couple of days until we just see it. But I, I, I would say that, you know, time is off the essence of this because a lot of companies rely on this business model, both in logistics and also SMEs here in Northern Ireland. Obviously, there's, there's, there's challenges if there are different sell by dates coming from the same factory um, and going to the, um, what, um, one recipient as well, and additional costs that are associated with that. So it, it doesn't come without um, its, its challenges. Um, so thank you. Um, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, my question I think it was Aidan referred to to us and not with us. What communication? Whoever had, and I'm supposed to refer this question to, to uh, Seamus and John. What communication was had with you? Obviously, you two gentlemen are sort of representing the sector. To be fair, 
What communication was, was with you from a period, of, a period of time ago about what issues you each seen was going to happen? So, in other words, when did that avenue of communication start, and did it start? Can Can you hear me here? Yes. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, Com communication yeah, has been extremely poor in relation to the detail. Um, we would have expected, uh, and the sector would have expected, if there's going to be significant change to a process or to a system, that we'd have got at least six to 12 months notification to ensure that everybody was fully trained up in the processes and the systems were fully embedded uh, in the companies. Uh, we were not communicated with effectively. I've called for, for an extended period of time for communication across the sector to be extended and to be effective as we're being talked to as opposed to actually seeking uh, seeking proper input i would say the communication has been extremely poor and even up until now uh, communication is still extremely poor okay um, and if I just come in there, Member, uh, so I suppose uh, um, uh, we have to be uh, mindful. We can't blame the civil servants and the government departments for this because um, I think communication has been there, but it's the detail. The detail has been missing because of the last-minute nature of the, the trade agreement between uh, UK and EU, is that the detail just simply wasn't there to give to us. So we were pressing for information that we didn't know it was there. And I think Aidan alluded to that parcel um, example, uh, we had the parcel sector simply didn't know whether they would have customs declarations to deal with up until the morning of New Year's Eve. Uh, and they couldn't wait that long. They had to just wind down their operations and see how this is going to affect. So I, I think the last minute nature of this, we really needed at least another six months from when the deal was agreed to implementation. So what's your thoughts now then from today? to the end of the great grace period, the, this 1st of April date as we refer to. What do you see the issues after that, if things aren't solved between now and then? And do you see a lot of issues ironing out to a degree between now and then? Obviously, you're going to have a new set of problems after that date. I think the, the IT systems, uh, with regards to customs, you know, we're looking at improvements of those. Um, the Trader Support Service has been given an extra £155 million pound to streamline that. So we really need, obviously, to make sure we're getting value for money and that we see delivery of that. Um, with the SPS, that grace period, um, the problem with that, the, and that's a cliff edge we need to avoid, the reason that expiry date is put on that is because the EU is changing it, the legislation around SPS, sanitary and phytosanitary controls, in the middle of April. Now, because the UK, the transition period's ended, they don't obviously have to follow European law. So it means basically you have a, a clear legal difference. So probably what we need to do, if we need that grace period, we probably need to apply pressure on London to adopt. So we're not asking them, say, can you implement European legislation, but simply do a copy and paste that, you know, whatever the changes are on the EU regs, we will, for a period of time, implement those on UK law. And that way, then, it's more likely we can try and get a grace period. And then, like myself and like with the Northern Iron Retail Consortium and other organisations have pushed for, and I think I mentioned it to the committee here earlier last year, we need to look for long-term solutions. So things like the retail movement scheme, where we open up a channel, a green channel for those trusted trader retailers and manufacturers who are moving high volume so that the, the four guys on the call here, we can ease the burden on them because this is what it's all about. It's basically just minimizing, lowering those hurdles to trade. Okay, and then the final question, I think it was Patrick who referred to it. I appreciate there's some competitors on the call regarding the figure to bring back a fridge or a trailer. 100 roughly to 200 pounds. What percentage of, of fridges do you bring back with no units on them, or is it just purely the, the, the fridge you're generally bringing back empty? I remember, you know, I think people should realize that it's not the cost of taking it back, it's the problem, it's the profitability of yeah. the loss of that load yeah. coming back on top of the cost yeah, yeah, yeah. is the real reality, you know. Once you leave Northern Ireland to go to across the water and back, it's called a round trip. Yeah. You're, you're basing your cost on that round trip. Whenever you're only getting fifty percent of that cost, you, you, you know financially the business can't survive going forward. And I don't think there's enough thought or process put into the businesses at the government level to support us. Like we're very heavily scrutinised legally 
on the likes of Rosa drivers hours. Drivers run out of time for six or seven hours in the port and another driver coming up the road to swap lorries or swap swap the driver around to get the get the things delivered. You know, I think government level we need to be more and more engaged in the industry to make them understand how fast we actually turn food and supplies around into Northern Ireland. Um, I think it'd be unfair to give you a cost with so many of our own colleagues in the same business. Hope that helps. No, 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 it, it does. But I do want to, I'm not going to get to the, the, the actual figures, but the question was, whenever you're bringing back trailers normally, go back a year, whenever you're moving product back and forth, I take it you're not bringing the unit back, it's only that the trailer will be full. You don't normally bring the units back. I take it you're dropping them at each side of the port and basically shipping an empty trailer or full trailers back and forth. No, you you be taking back the lorry driver company. Um, I think maybe you may be thinking more of the container scenario yeah, yeah, yeah. as in refrigeration yeah. um, NA to cross the water. It will be a lot of it will be driver company, um, and you could be looking up the cost of. It depends on what lane. If it's going by Liverpool on the night ferry, it could be two hundred, three hundred quid for the ferry alone. Um, Lauren Belfast could be two hundred, two twenty plus your your diesel and your your details on top of that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks very much, everyone. And uh, I think this brings a <coughs> sharp focus. Um, <coughs> sorry, interdependent we all are. I would like to thank uh, those representatives from the industry for the work that they've done over the past challenging uh, year. Um, it's a uh, um, the picture uh, is a good one. Um, some might say it was entirely predictable, and it's not helped, I don't think, by the fact we have a Secretary of State who is still in denial, uh, if that's who we're relying upon, to put forward your case to the British government and through them to the EU in relation to seeking solutions. Uh, so there is an uphill struggle, and it's my understanding that we are in a grace period, that actually the situation in front of us looks worse than the one that we're currently in. So I, I think we need to pick up very quickly of what the key challenges are post this grace period and, and what, the, what, what the picture then and the scenario uh, would look like for, for the sector and uh, for uh, retail. Um, and could I uh, just pick up on one that was made I think maybe John Martin made it in relation to uh, what's good enough to eat in um, Karen Ryan would be good enough to eat in Belfast and what are we protecting? Well, you know, I'm very firmly of the view we're protecting the standards, the food standards, and I'd have to say I have absolutely good faith in the British government not to reduce their standards, and, and that's something I just would want to put on record, you know, given uh, the act of bad faith we've seen in the British government over the last number of years. But in terms of um, so what some of the members are saying, uh, in terms of how we can help uh, the sector going forward. I think there's a huge amount of lobbying to be done through whatever mechanism in relation to um, uh, the experience hauliers, hauliers and others are finding. There's the welfare of drivers and there's also obviously the issue of time spent driving and that downtime sitting around ports, I suppose, and how that impacts on the regulations in relation to uh, drivers' hours. So I just wonder, you know, if people were being very pedantic, you know, if a driver has no restroom or anywhere, uh, but he's not physically driving, but yet you're, as a haulier, going to have to go and replace him. Um, how, how can, surely there's still, from a regulatory point of view, the driver has still um, been uh, at work or available for work for over the scheduled hours, over the scheduled hours. I'm just wondering how you would resolve that, I suppose, in a very long-winded way, or what resources would be needed uh, at ports or facilities where drivers are uh, kept waiting for so long uh, to enable any um, uh, change within the regulations in relation to driver hours, and has that been discussed with uh, driver representative groups if such thing exists? Come in there, Ms. Kelly, uh, in relation to drivers' hours. As I said, I have requested the department to offer some relaxation in relation to drivers' hours and rest periods, given the pressure the sector is under. And I'm around similar provisions that was provided at the start of the COVID process. But I think in addition to that, we need the enforcement agencies, both within Northern Ireland, as in the DVA, GB, as in the DVS, say 
empathetic approach to dealing with it because drivers are actually feeling the full consequences of, of it and having to sit up in various locations in a cab, which is not ideal with insufficient welfare facility. So I think there has to be a sympathetic approach adopted by the department to put off the provisions uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. And can I just say, uh, Madam Chair, through to you, to Aidan, in relation to the um, uh, scaremongering, you know, and the uh, risk of stockpiling, you know, uh, by those probably who are a bit more financially able to do it, and then obviously people, uh, you know, who, who don't have the money to, to stockpile, you know, what are the risks in that, and how to manage the public messaging around it? I think the public messaging is very important. I think we need to be realistic that there are choice challenges at the moment, but we need to put that in perspective. There are a few hundred items that are missing out of a large supermarket. Average large supermarket is between 40,000 and 50,000 product lines. There are, are several hundred are, are missing. I do understand that some people worry, um, but the big message is that um, the boys in, 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 in haulage and logistics are working 24-7. The people in retail are working 24-7. And we are doing all of the hard work, and that means the public does not have to do it. And in fact, you know, if you are stockpiling and if you are overbuying is a better word for it, then what a lot of people are doing is they're buying up lots of mints. Now, there are people for whom mints is a staple, and they rely on being able to do that. It's the same when we saw in March with the toilet roll. People bought loads of the the the, um, the uh, lower level, lower price bracket uh, toilet rolls, and that meant that the people who rely on that to feed their families, to keep their families clean, um, weren't able to get that. So the big message is that we are being realistic. There are a few uh, choice and availability issues. They are getting better. And it is thanks to the hard work of Seamus's guys, of John's guys, of, of everybody in the retail sector as well. So again, that big message is that we are doing the hard work so that the consumers don't have to buy normally and be kind, obviously, to our shop workers. <laughs> yeah, Dean. Um, could I ask, Chair, uh, one final question maybe to Seamus? Um, there were, um, I I'm curious to know in relation to the time taken at ports for customs, etc., uh, if any of your uh, hauliers and maybe some of the hauliers themselves, in terms of the, the, the time taken and the checks uh, uh, in Dublin, for example, and how that would compare then to uh, Cherbourg or you know or Do you know Calais and Dover, and whether there's any big discrepancy because it is about entering uh, you know the EU, so to speak. And uh, I'm just curious about how how that uh, time compares. And and obviously, or sorry, uh, uh, over the COVID period, we were uh, informed that there was a risk of many hauliers going bust. I just wonder. Uh, has that materialised or have hauliers managed to be uh, sustained uh, throughout uh, the financial challenges that COVID presented? Okay, um, thank you very much, Ms Kelly. And uh, I suppose I'll do your first question, but your first question after I've answered this question, I think it'd be good to open it up to the four hauliers just to give you some of their practical experience. Um, Dublin, um, not a good place to go at the moment, and that's an understatement. Um, it's, it's testament that um, Belfast, Larne and Warren Point are actually doing pretty good. Um, I literally just received a text message from one of the ferry companies saying Cairn Ryan route into here is, is, is fine. Uh, any delays really here in Belfast and Larne, really, it is um, down to the SPS controls, going to the border control post with SPS. And, and that's where the breakdown of communication has been in the identification checks. Uh, most of those, um, in the first few days, we had a high level of non-compliance. It was businesses just not knowing the rules. I think one hollier mentioned that we, we weren't aware and wasn't made aware to a lot of operators beforehand. So we had a lot of people having to do retrospective entries while the vehicles were detained. Uh, and obviously, you know, there's welfare issues for the drivers there, you know, but we, we, we had some vehicles, I'm aware of some members having vehicles maybe eight hours detained while they have to do these retrospective, which, you know, it, it, it's not fair on the driver and it's burning money for the business as well. Dublin at the moment, um, that's a place really, uh, it's a world apart because obviously they, they don't have... Um, 
the easements that we have, the grace periods, for example, um, they're checking 30% of the lorries going in. Um, they're uh, insisting on 24-hour pre-notifications, whereas we can live with four. Um, I was in a meeting along with Aidan with the Irish um, government recently. We put it to them, can you not give the same flexibilities in Dublin. And we're not even asking this for Northern Irish operators, for everyone, because it will benefit the Irish economy. And they were sticking to the rule book on that. And I don't know why they won't be more flexible on that. They need to. And um, we're, we're in a lucky position, Logistics UK, because we also have a trade association in the Republic of Ireland, FTA Ireland. Uh, and they're pressing, uh, I think they had a letter to the T-shot last week. They got a lot of publicity on that. So we're pushing for that. The same um, is obviously with um, Dover Cali. The French are being quite stringent, especially on food um, going in from, from GB as well. So there are welfare issues there. Um, before we hand over to the hauliers who will talk about their own experiences on the COVID um, situation, I think, yeah, um, you know, certainly I made the case last May when I give evidence that we needed a means test because not everyone was in the same bracket of financial difficulty. And I think there was, um, you know, there was a lot of fear in the market that uh, a high percentage, I think there was some people were talking about upwards of maybe 50% in the industry going under. Um, that, that wasn't going to happen. Um, there, were, there were some companies who were getting by, they were finding work. There were others, and this, has, this can't go on. A lot of people have taken on a lot of debt, and they will be paying off that debt for years ahead, years ahead. And we need to be mindful of that. And I, what I've pressed for with the minister and the committee is that we need mind, uh, means-tested um, help for any operators. Okay. Uh, Ms. Guy, if I, I can uh, come back in as a haulier um, here, Dublin, uh, Monday morning, 71 trailers, 24 pulled in for checks, that's 33%. Um, today, I think we're at 27% check, I just haven't got the exact numbers. Um, Dublin is, uh, Seamus's words are a difficult place to be in at the moment. Um, What's going to happen in Northern Ireland come the 1st of April is going to be exactly what's going on in Dublin at the moment. Um, unless there is some form of easement, it is going to get much worse here before it gets much better. Um, I'm not a politician. I don't want to belong to be a politician. Um, though you were in my Portadown constituency, uh, Ms Kelly, so bottom line is I'm not getting involved in it. But as a haulier, uh, Northern Ireland's going to get worse in April. If we don't get some easement, I hear what uh, the three industry representatives are saying here. Um, but there must be much more engagement with the haulage business directly. Um, speaking through our, our, our associations, I, and I'm not knocking anybody here at all, I'm looking all the different views and Brexit, um, but you must engage much more with the haulage business or the logistics business directly, especially in Northern Ireland. Um, like the retail, we're employing lots and lots of people here um, in both Northern Ireland and, and in GB and in Dublin. Um, and it, it's, it's not a particularly easy place to be working in. Thank goodness for our loyalty with our, our, our employees. Um, but it's been very hard and it's very tolerant uh, people that we're dealing with. Um, as regards going back to the other question about the COVID survival, um, we, we, we had all sorts of meetings with infrastructure and economy, um, MLAs, and, and that I was involved in, and we, we didn't get any assistance whatsoever. What we had to do, as the haulage business does, we had to cut our cloth accordingly. We had to, uh, unfortunately, lose people um, and not replace as many trucks. That reduces the flexibility and the just-in-time operation that we, as a haulage business, can operate here. And that plan, to be fair, was put in place for this year uh, from last year because we obviously knew at some stage Brexit was going to hit us and hit us hard. So you have to be very flexible in this business, but it's like turning the ship. You can't do it on a six months. You have to be planning months ahead. And as Ian says, this needs six months, 12 months to bed in as a haulier. We are hauliers. We are not customs agents. We are not politicians. We are employing people moving freight between Ireland GB and GB Ireland. That's what we do. Thanks very much, Paul, and uh, the other contributors. Uh, Madam Chair, I think there's some actions that we'll be able to take out of uh, those contributions and, and come to a conclusion at the end of the meeting. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Beggs. Again, can I thank everyone uh, for, for your evidence? Um, and I would also like to uh, place on record my thanks to the Hollywood sector for what you have done during uh, this COVID period, both in the path and what you continue to do to provide that essential service. Um, all your staff are our key workers, ensuring they're stood on shelves, but also ensuring that there is an economy still, still working. So that needs to be recognised your importance. But what, you, what you've told us today is, is that uh, the haulage sector is bearing the brunt of these changes, which have been hastily introduced at the last possible minute, and uh, it's then costing, costing you financially and also costing in terms of the welfare of your drivers and making it more difficult for you to recruit uh, in the future. Undoubtedly, all of that will have major cost implications uh, going forward to you and to the Northern Ireland economy, so it's important that we would um, try and mitigate and minimise those difficulties and, and potential costs. Now, uh, my, my first question is in terms of um, government uh, and these new joint committee, which is determining everything. Uh, in what way have they engaged with the haulage and logistics industry directly so that they fully understand your needs and come, can uh, adapt what they have brought in to make it practical? H have, they, have they engaged? Is there a joint working group formally established linked to the joint committee as of yet? Certainly, um, Madam Chairperson, if I can come in on that, I certainly haven't been engaged with anybody from the Joint Committee. I have on a number of occasions written to the Secretary of State, Brenton, Brenton Lewis, for better engagement. And he, he, he excuse, excuse me for saying, but he hasn't had the courtesy to respond. I think it's obvious that there hasn't been proper engagement with the people that matter, which is the holliers on the ground. Any process that uh, they're expected to implement, it isn't working as it should, and they're suffering the consequences. There has to be better effective engagement. There has to be working groups set up where actual holliers are involved, holliers' views are sought, because any imposed solution is not going to work unless you involve the people that are critical to it, which is the holliers. Just as a quick follow-up to that, you, you've indicated that some of the systems don't even talk to each other. I think Dublin was mentioned in particular. Um, but in, in, again, in, in the design of the systems that government has put together, uh, have they, was there discussions with the haulage industry uh, even at that stage? Or, or does our current systems need major uh, simplification and, and refinement? I think if some of the hauliers could come in and comment as to whether you know, they have been spoken to or the issues have been discussed directly uh, with government with them. James, did you want to come in on that point? Um, I, I suppose, Madam Chair, yeah. Um, yeah the, the, the joint committee isn't set up for direct engagement with industry or businesses. Um, certainly, I think the Northern Executive, from my understanding, can have a seat around the table whenever a representative of the Irish government is at, is at the table. Uh, and we obviously, you know, we've got to use our influence, and this is where, you know, the MLA, your work's invaluable because it's, um, you can feed that in through the executive and then into the, 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 the joint committee. Um, we have to remember the Northern Ireland Protocol, it's a live document, it's not a completed book and it's there, it can be changed, it can be edited and what our job is to do and what MLA's is, is to reflect industry feedback from ourselves and to try and make the protocol sustainable for the long run because I think it's in the UK's and the EU's interests that it works for all of us. Um, I know myself and Aidan, we've met five times um, with the EU Commission on this. We, we, we keep in contact with them and also with the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and then with the Cabinet Office and the NIO. Uh, and I know I've had members here engaged directly as well with um, the UK government on this. But I think the key with the Joint Committee is our influence really with, with the local assembly here and feeding in our concerns as well. Then, then in terms of the um, with difficulties at present, but really 
Uh, there are these future cliff edges that are coming, uh, the 1st of April and uh, the 1st of July. Uh, mention was made by one of the hauliers, I think it might have been Noel, um, that uh, you could expect what's happening in Dublin to happen at uh, Larne, Belfast and Warren Point on the 1st of April. Uh, is, that, is that clearly what's going to happen if, unless there's change? Can someone? Uh, yeah, member. Uh, I, I that was my comment. What I said is, we're looking down the abyss here from the first of April. What's happening in Dublin? Um, and we, we, you know, I think Aidan said there we're an eighth of the way through this period, so we've still got time to fix that. And we, as operators, hauliers. Logis logistics operators, call us what you want. We're adaptable individuals, and, and we're, we're willing, and we want to make this work. We, we can have our own opinion on, on Brexit, and whether you're in one camp or the other, it, it's irrelevant to me. We, we want to move freight. That's what we do, and that's how we try and make money. Um, unfortunately, we're not making any at the minute, but uh, there is an abyss coming on, on, in April here in Northern Ireland, unless uh, we're engaged fully here and there is easement of some form. We do not want to be doing this in Northern Ireland, what we're doing in Dublin. I mean, our operation in Dublin is just a complete mess today. Um, and I, there's no other nice way of saying it. And it, it, it can't be allowed to happen here. We've got a bit more time here to try and make that happen. But we also need whatever influence we, we, we can have with this committee and any other committee um, to try and get some assistance from our, our near neighbour as well um, to make this work much better for us all. Can, can I ask specifically in terms of the experience in Dublin? Um, you've indicated drivers are being delayed, I think up to 22 hours has been mentioned. Um, if that were to happen at Northern Ireland, at ports. Will you be able to get food on supermarket shelves? Um, I, uh, our, our first experience on, on the first Monday, the first full Monday of, of operation in Dublin, we had 32 hours delay with drivers. Um, and uh, as I said, drivers actually having to come in and asking, can I go and use the bathroom um, over that period of time. And one of those gentlemen was a 69-year-old driver that, that we had um, so that, that's the situation in, in, in Dublin from day one. We were also the first truck out through the customs on day one in, on, on that Monday morning as well. So it, it works when it works when, when, you're, when you get green land. Um, but the amount of inspection in Dublin, um, what will happen in Northern Ireland is if it's delayed. I mean, we're running out of trailers in Northern Ireland at the moment. We're having to ship in empty trailers. So... Uh, if that's the situation that we are in mid-January, will it be much worse in April? I'm not the doom merchant here. I don't want to predict that. But if something doesn't change, there will definitely be problems on 1st of April. Just a final, final question on, on that issue. My uh, previous experience when I, when I worked in industry was it was uh, understood to be cheaper to uh, export a load from Northern Ireland, that, that was almost the back load. There was more goods coming in than going out, and that the majority of money was made in bringing the goods in. Was that still the system, and is what's happening at present, where there's actually more goods being exported than imported, uh, completely shaking up your, your financial model? Yes, the financial model works on an, on a, on an east-west basis, on, a, on what someone alluded to, I think Patrick said, about a round-trip basis. Um, that's 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 how it works. Um, it, it it has been, and you're rightly so. That um, loads out of Northern Ireland have been a lot cheaper than loads coming into Northern Ireland. But it's worked on the round trip. That 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 gap has fallen over the years, and, and rightly so, because the ship, whether you're coming west, is the same rate as going east. It's the same cost to sail the ship at night time as it is daytime. So the, the shipping variance, and, and that's where the shipping companies have put the hauliers under severe pressure over the last few years, because they've just imposed increases on us. Not negotiated, just imposed. Um, and that, that 
that the, the, the difference between a load out of Northern Ireland and a load coming in from England into Northern Ireland, that, that gap's starting to, to, to close in um, and, and over the coming years it will close in. Uh, but, you know, that's, it, it works on the east-west flow and the, and the nice level seesaw up, down, up, down um, movement. It's not working that way at the moment. And uh, somebody alluded there that they would have to put the prices up by about 12%. That the consumer's going to have to pay that. The, you know, the Northern Ireland public's going to have to pay that. It's going to distort inflation. But that's what's going to happen because as a whole is business, this is currently an unsustainable model and we have to be engaged with directly and we have to have it sorted out before the 1st of April here. We have to. Okay, thank you. Um, we have we have three more members wishing to ask questions and I don't want to curtail that, but... Just be mindful, um, I guess, whenever you're responding, that we have until 20 past one before we have to leave this room. So I'm just putting that right there at this stage. So if I can call Miss Kimmins. Right, thanks, Chair. Um, no, just firstly to thank everyone um, for, for coming this morning. I think, particularly for myself, um, I've learned quite a lot and quite the, the finer details of this and, and I suppose all of the questions that we have been asking officials and others um, over the last 12 months particularly that we haven't been able to get any answers to uh, we're now seeing the, the outworking of them um, unfortunately and obviously the timing and the, the lack of planning and preparation that's been in place um, is having huge implications and I, I really don't envy any of your task whether you're representative or right down to to the drivers themselves, it is, it's very challenging. And I suppose one of the important points um, for me coming out of all this is, you know, in the last year we've seen particularly the, the vital role that um, hauliers play whenever we were dealing with, with the pandemic in terms of keeping supplies running uh, in and out to, to this island. Um, so that should have been a, a learning for everyone. Um, just a couple of questions, I suppose. A lot of a lot has been covered, so I don't want to go over old ground. Be back, um, firstly to to Aidan's points, um, and I think I think it's pertinent the points Aidan you made around um, this ha this can't all be blamed on the protocol. I think we have seen, you know, the media has sensationalised quite a lot of it, but uh, as well as that, the, there's been similar issues in terms of product lines in in Europe. I think um, I've seen photos from Paris where Marks and Spencers had um, missed. You know there, there were the empty shelves and things like that too so i think it's safe to say this isn't all um to do with the protocol but it's just you'd mentioned the um the PCA and you and, and some of the issues around that do you think then as well as that that there's potentially any missed opportunities for for business aiden aiden you're on mute so we can see you your lips moving <laughs> I apologise. That happens to me every single meeting. I apologise profusely. Um, so uh, there are going to be uh, opportunities, especially in, in manufacturing uh, in, in Northern Ireland, where you can take things in, give added value, and then export them to uh, Great Britain, uh, to the EU, uh, both unfettered, and then to the, to the rest of the world, depending on, on what, what um, trade uh, 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 agreements we get. I think the TCA, the, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, I think it was a huge uh, missed opportunity. I think it, like it is not a free trade agreement, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a cooperation and, and association agreement under Article 207 of the TEFEU. And, and that is really, really loose when we needed a bit more uh, tightness, especially in the, in the realms of, of, of SPS. You know, if, if I had a, a magic wand and I was putting together uh, that TCA, it would have been an FTA. It would have had security and safety arrangements. It would have had a veterinary agreement. It would have had a veterinary agreement that would be first in class things uh, like um, the, North, uh, the New Zealand um, veterinary agreement, which means that there's a, a high level of dynamic alignment. That means when one party moves, uh, the other party moves as well. And that means that there's only one percent checks now if we had got that that would mean that there would be seven lorries a day that would need to be checked out of all of the stuff that was crossing the irish sea just seven lorries we didn't get that now the best thing about the trade and, and cooperation agreement isn't just the zero tariffs uh, zero um quotas uh, that, that's in there because there are some some real 
tussly bits, shall we say, or grisly bits um, about rules of origin and about accumulation, diagonal accumulation, that sort of thing, which are really complicated. The best thing about the TCA is that it provides a framework for future engagement. And, and that's a really good word, the frame. So you can then stick on things and agree different things. If you look at where Switzerland is, um, Switzerland, it's taken 40 years and they have 210 pieces of agreement with the EU. They've still got a wee bit of friction, but they have a good working relationship, a good import and export relationship. And that's in the future where we need to get to. Okay, no, thank you. And I suppose just in, in terms of the protocol, and as I said, we're hearing a lot of negatives, um, negative connotations around that, and I suppose because of what we're seeing on the ground. Um, just to get a fuller picture, you know, obviously, and I know certainly our position was that this was the least worst option in, in, what, in terms of Brexit. Um, are you seeing any positives of it yet, or is it, do you think it's too, still too early to say I think whenever the protocol came out, um, the statement that I put out said was that the Prime Minister had neither listened to business in Northern Ireland, the business community in Northern Ireland, and had uh, neither had he listened to, to communities in Northern Ireland, especially since our households here have half of the discretionary income of great British households. However, business people are pragmatic, and once that was agreed, once that was signed off, and once that was passed, we actually even tried to get amendments to that, and we worked with the five parties to try and get amendments, and that would have given a wee bit more closeness, a wee bit more sucker to uh, Northern Ireland. We didn't get uh, that, but we broke the narrative that Northern Ireland is sorted, and we will continue to say that Northern Ireland is not sorted. In the future, there are great opportunities for those who can add value and send out. That's particularly in the manufacturing. It did protect us from immediate shocks of losing you know we, we have integrated supply chains across these islands you know and and it's you know our supply chain was built over 40 years of being in the eu and it is cyclical and taking away any part on a jumper does not work so there was always going to be pain i think if you look at dairy for example and the fact that over 35 percent of our milk is processed down south and they can continue to do that that it is it is a good thing you cannot take away from that however I have always said in this past three or four years, no matter what type of Brexit we would have, there would be costs because there would be frictions, either frictions with the EU, frictions with GB. That's why we wanted no borders anywhere. Quite simply, where there's friction, there's cost, and the people of Northern Ireland can't afford that cost. Yeah, well, thank you. I suppose just to the Holliers then as well, in terms of that question around the protocol, is there, you know, have you seen anything that suggests to you that there are positives coming from it yet? Or likewise, is it still a bit early said because of all the, the challenges that you're facing? Morning, member. Yeah, I would like to say, you know, um, local supply certainly has increased in Northern Ireland to some of the UK supermarkets. You know, um, in a previous life, I worked in Belfast Fruit Market which today uh, most people wouldn't even know it existed because um, things changed, uh, crazy prices were taken over, stewards were going away. But locally, you know, look at farmers today, um, there isn't as many farmers growing local produce. It has now been coming across uh, from the UK. So hopefully this will be a positive for local supply for the farmers, but also for the producers that are producing the exact same things across the water that are being coming back into Northern Ireland. So I think local supply will help us as Northern Ireland, the economy, uh, make us stronger. But I would also make the point that any of the customers that uh, myself and my colleagues all work for are all grant aided. Like hauliers do not get any grant or any financial um, support in uh, no matter what they've done. Um, so I think that needs to be looked at as well, um, just to make a point. But yes, I do see a positive for local supply, for manufacturing of food, of, uh, of vegetables, of farming, I do think it will help us in Northern Ireland to, to, to a level of, of better needs. Thanks. If, if I just come in there very quickly, um, yeah, I agree 100%, Patrick, that's what I'm hearing. Um, even in your own local constituency, I've spoken to one business this week who's sourcing 90% of their produce local. They were getting 10% um, through a wholesaler in GB of European products. They're now buying direct from France um, some of those products. So you will probably see some people um, cast their net and maybe begin trading relationships with people they previously hadn't uh, and ultimately save money and those costs come on. I think the big, the big question I'm getting nearly every day, people are asking me about transit. 
um, and a lot of European businesses aren't aware that they can trade with Northern Ireland without any um, customs declarations or SPS controls. So I'm outlining to people how you can do that. So I think there's a, definitely a job uh, in the future for Invest Northern Ireland um, to promote Northern Ireland as a place across the EU, as a place to do business with and drive inward investment here. Okay. Okay, I know. Thank you. If you're content, I can move on. I'm down to 12 minutes for, to conclude the meeting. Just as a question, Chair, because um, I think it's a very important one and has come up quite a number of times. And, and I'm, I'm like a broken record at this stage, but in terms of financial support for hauliers, you know, Seamus and John will know that, that we've raised this time and time again as, in terms of the COVID pandemic. Um, and, and we warned that this was going to be... Um, further compounded by Brexit for Hollier and we're told by officials and by the minister that the evidence wasn't there that a support scheme was needed. You know, we, we, Paul Jackson mentioned earlier on about uh, having to lose staff and, and not replace trucks. To me, what, what evidence do you um, And I think as, as um, Paul, um, Patrick said there as well, you know, everyone else is getting grant data except hauliers. You know, we do recognise that maybe not every company is in the same position and, and some had done better than others. But I definitely think I did ask for this to be reviewed again. And then we were stonewalled. There's still been no response. So just as a committee chair, I think that we need to urgently uh, ask the minister to review this decision and look at a support scheme, which isn't just in result in response to COVID, but also in response to what we're facing now. Um, we are aware, uh, following the January monitoring rounds, that there are a number of underspends, um, including in the Department for Infrastructure. So now is the time um, to address this because, you know, as, as has been really um, demonstrated here this morning, if businesses like the, the hauliers don't get the support they need, um, it just even to get us to the stage of, of on the other side of what they're facing at the minute, a lot of these businesses aren't going to be able to survive, and that's going to have huge impacts for for here um, going forward. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I I only do have ten minutes, and that's to conclude this session and also then to, to wind up. So I'm going to call um, uh, Miss Anderson, and then followed by Andrew, uh, Mr. Muir. Um, John, Seamus, uh, Aidan and all the rest of you, it's impossible uh, to do justice and service to what you've just imparted to us today. Um, I think it's important for you to know that in terms of the derogation and the simplification and the easements that you're looking for, of course, Sinn Féin had been arguing for an extension um, to the transition period and it's unfortunate that, that we didn't get that. My concern um, about this and I would imagine that given the level of information that you have particularly you're able to differentiate between an association agreement and a free trade agreement and you know the consequences of Brexit we always said it was going to be a mitigated disaster but can I ask you in relation to the preparation work that needs to take place between now and the 1st of April and July because in the event of not getting the easement, easements that is being sought for here, and of course uh, there is a joint committee, there's a specialist committee that can feed into the joint committee and we can, find, we can use whatever influence that we have. We know that the British government has made a unilateral declaration which prohibits the British government from seeking an extension to the grace periods uh, because they have to take all the necessary measures to ensure the compliance with the relevant EU law on the 1st of April and on July. So my concern is that we can all try our utmost and our best to make sure because the preparation work did not take place and you got the information lastminute.com, even though the protocol had been in existence for quite a while, I fear that the grace period may not be extended and therefore I would ask what kind of preparation work is being done now to prepare for the 1st of April in the event of, if, for instance, we hope by that stage what's happening in Dublin will have rectified itself in some way, but what is happening there is a consequence of an association agreement and Brexit, so we need to be putting the, the measures in place now to deal with those If 
if I just say first of all, Ms. Anderson, um, yeah, I, I think it, it's going back to my earlier point. To get any grace period extended, we need the UK government to voluntarily align with uh, SPS regs. Um, so that's where a focus of our attention is going to be, because I, I can't imagine any UK businesses are itching not to align with it. I don't think it's going to change their business model overnight, maybe in the longer term. But I think for the short term to help us, that's where we would like to apply our pressure. If I could maybe come in there, Ms. Anderson, just w w one thing that I would highlight today is that if you have any influence in setting up a Northern Irish working group to look at this and to ensure there's a consistent approach to the issues being put forward. That working group would be a transport stroke retail related working group to ensure that our concerns are channeled through uh, the, the local executive who can feed into any higher level negotiations. And Chair, just listening to, to the responses, I think the committee would probably concur with a few. There needs to be better communication. Uh, as well as the point that you raised about the COVID health checks, we also need to look at the issue of workers' rights. It was quite alarming listening to Chris and others about uh, the way the drivers are being treated and how they are feeling. So the workers' rights issues need to be uh, protected. I don't know, Seamus, if it's uh, if it's voluntarily sort of just doing the SPS checks because, as Aidan has said, the EU is very legalistic, very precise, and this. Uh, agreement has been signed off. This TCA has been signed off. The withdrawal agreement has been signed off. So it might take somewhat more than just a voluntary uh, nod from the British government that it is going to comply or continue with the EU law, even though I believe that they won't, based on everything that they have said thus far. So my concern is, Seamus, in the event of that not happening, what kind of preparation work can be done now so we don't wait to the 1st of April, the British government telling us they're not going to comply with us, and then we're at the cliff edge once again. That needs to be avoided now. Seamus, it might be helpful if um, you had conversations perhaps with some of your members and John similarly, um, and maybe respond to us in writing, if that would be helpful. Yes, we'll carry on. That'd be useful. Unless you have any sort of brief comment with regard to that at this stage. I'll leave it in that chair given the time frame. Okay, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm just conscious of time, so I'll stay focused on this. Just to thank everyone for coming along today and all the work that's been done, particularly the focus around solutions for this issue. We need to have solutions focused around this. Um, we can, Margaret Thatcher once said, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. Didn't agree with an awful lot what she said, but that was probably <laughs> one small scintilla of an element that I would agree with her in relation to that. Um, just in relation to this, there's two ways forward uh, around this. One is around solutions around SPS and around the grace periods, while the other one's invoking of Article 16. Uh, just from the trade representatives, it's a focus around the first element, which is around the SPS, and also in relation to the grace periods, or is it in relation to Article 16? And if it's Article 16, can you outline to me what the implications would be of invoking that? Okay, I suppose if it's, if it's the legal question, I can jump in if you don't mind. Um, so on, on Article 16, so it's a safeguard and a mechanism for unilaterally putting uh, a safeguard in place. It, it, it's a usual thing that actually gets put in the, um, the agreement. So like Article 112 of the uh, European Economic Area Agreement is, has the same. But everyone keeps quoting Clause 1, which means the unilateral uh, measures that can be taken. The, the, it has to be ongoing, it has to be specific. We're also seeing things happening in GB, so it's not specific uh, to Northern Ireland. It hasn't met the test of being strictly necessary. It hasn't met the test of um, the significant harm as yet. Um, I'm not saying that you can't do it, but it's a big red nuclear button and you cannot press it, it yet. If you do press that, then um, clause two, which no one wants to talk about, is that they can uh, have tech, the EU can take reciprocal measures. That can be anything from making everything at risk, making it harder to use the port of, 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 of Dublin. Um, there are lots of things that would, would need to happen. So, um, And if you're going to use Article 16, you have to tell uh, the Joint Committee 
beforehand and they have to agree that you can take those unilateral steps. A lot of people are talking about this, that you can use it to set aside the protocol on hold. You cannot do that. The only thing under Article 18 of the Northern Ireland Protocol that can set it aside, and you can't set aside all of it, it's only uh, provisions 1 to 5, Articles 1 to 5, they can only be set aside if and when MLAs vote for it in 2024. That is the first chance. So Article 16 is a bit of a, a, a red herring. We haven't met the tests to do it. We haven't um, uh, started that process with the uh, with the uh, UK government telling the Joint Committee that they want to do it. And we haven't made clear what the reciprocal arrangements that the EU will want to push. It's a big, big red nuclear option. There's a lot of stuff we will need to do before we get to that. And there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. We're only a couple of weeks in. Thank you, Ian. I would say, Mr Muir, uh, Aidan can explain that a lot more eloquently than me, and I'll leave that to him, so I'll not go in. I think he's covered all the bases. I would say, um, certainly in my industry, I've talked to people about Article 16. I think they've been missold the idea. They, they, they've maybe read things, heard things. Um, so I've had to outline the consequences of that, which Aidan would say. And I would say, basically, to some people, they see Article 16 as a, as a life raft. But to me, it's a life raft, yeah, but with a big puncture in it because it, it's, it, you are literally out of the frying pan and into the fire with it. I think we need to be solution-led here. We need to be pragmatic and work with the EU and the UK government to mitigate this mess. Okay, Andrew, you... All right, can we come in there? In relation to Article 16, I'm not prepared to comment on it. It's a political decision. All we're trying to do is to ensure that the political uh, representatives understand the issues, the impact of the issues on the sector and the consequences of those issues if they're not addressed. What we would say is the protocol is a fine document. However, some of the requirements imposed by the protocol need to be looked at in the short term to ease the pressure on the sector, give a bit of confidence back into the suppliers and to allow trade to move, particularly from GB to Northern Ireland. Andrew, can I just ask if there's any additional questions that you'd yeah, like to ask? Yeah, that's no problem. Sorry. Yeah, because I was going to ask if we could get them addressed via um, written response. If... No, I totally am. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can I just thank everyone for their attendance this morning? That was a, a, a very informative session, um, and certainly there are a number of actions which um, we will want to take as a committee um, coming out of that. So thank you very much, all of you, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, obviously, we have we have actually run out of time for, for the use of this room. Uh, there were a number of aspects. Thank you. Thank you. There were a number of aspects probably that we we'd like to follow up on, but um, I suppose just because of the time, um, if we can get agreement, perhaps that we do write to the department with regards to the issue around a support scheme for um, the haulage industry again, given the very exceptional circumstances they're now finding themselves in. Um, and, um, and drivers hours. There's also the issue in relation to drivers hours. A number of other aspects of that, we, if you're content that we can address during matters arising at next week's meeting. Would you, Chair, we don't have time. Um, Ms. Very quickly. Uh, Chair, I'm going to suggest that maybe um, in relation to the Brexit question and, and the TEO and the, the, the representation that would be required with the British government and the Irish government, that perhaps you might want to consider writing to raise some of the concerns that they have raised with us in terms of their experience at the different ports. Yeah, well, I mean, that would be a suggestion would be to write to the ports in relation to that. But if you're content that we can look at that next week, and we also have officials coming to to brief us on Brexit um, related <coughs> issues at that stage as well. And, and there was a suggestion that a working group be established involving retail and hauliers. Well, if you're content, we can address that at next week's meeting because I, we are really out of out of time. Um, can I just get agreement for the for, Can I just get agreement for the forward work program for next week? It's at page 81. Um, buses and coach operators have now confirmed their attendance and alongside um, road maintenance. Um, again, um, we're going to move through. We don't have time for any other business. So, if you're content, the next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. in the Senate Chamber, Wednesday, the 27th of January. Thank you very much for your attendance. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.